For thousands of years, people knew only about the planets Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, which they could see using simple telescopes, or even by the naked eye, if conditions were good. But in the late 18th century, a famous astronomer named Sir William Herschel discovered a new planet that was icy blue in color. At first, people thought it was a star, but later they realized it was a planet. Today, we know it as Uranus, a planet that's more than 19 times farther away from the Sun than Earth. It's so far away that it takes Uranus 84 years to complete one trip around the Sun. This astronomer also discovered many other interesting things in space, like double stars and nebulae. In the mid-1800s, scientists noticed something pulled Uranus and strangely tugged its orbit. They thought there must be another planet out there, and they used math to predict where it would be. Finally, in 1846, they found Neptune using a telescope. It was too faint to see with the naked eye because it was too far away from the sun. It was all so exciting. Who knows how many other planets could be there lurking in the darkness of our solar system. Back in the mid-1800s, Astronomers noticed something unusual was happening in the sky. A small rocky planet named Mercury was behaving strangely. It didn't follow the predictable orbit that was expected of it. One of the astronomers was a brilliant French scientist named Urbain Le Verrier. He came up with a theory that there could be another planet in our solar system no one had yet discovered. It would be located somewhere between Mercury and the Sun. This hypothetical planet, which he named Vulcan after the Roman god of fire, would have an incredibly hot surface. And it could be a potential explanation for Mercury's strange behavior. He never surely claimed Vulcan was really the one thing disturbing the orbit of Mercury. But excited by the possibility of discovering a new planet, astronomers all over the world took the idea of Vulcan. For a planet that didn't exist, People committed to developing ideas and getting information about it. Some scientists didn't think it was likely that they had missed another planet as big as Mercury. It would have been hard not to see it by then. But there was a tiny chance of a smaller planet existing inside Mercury's orbit that was too close to the Sun so no one could see it. One theory said it was about 13 million miles away from the Sun. Mercury is the planet with the most eccentric orbit in our solar system, but the closest point it gets to the Sun is about 28.5 million miles. This means Vulcan would be under half of that distance. The theory moved on, saying that if Vulcan existed, it would orbit the Sun every 19 days and 18 hours, and its path would be tilted about 12 degrees relative to the path of other planets in our solar system. Vulcan's position at its furthest point from the Sun would still be too close to the Sun to be seen with the naked eye, even during twilight. The only chance of seeing Vulcan would be during a solar eclipse, or when it passed in front of the Sun, which, as the theory said, would be two to four times a year. They had a theory that this mysterious planet was so close to the Sun that it could only be seen during a total solar eclipse when the Moon blocked out the Sun's blinding glare. So, every time there was an eclipse, scientists would peer at the Sun, hoping to catch a glimpse of Vulcan. They were trying really hard, but no matter what, they couldn't find this mysterious planet. Some astronomers claimed to have spotted it during eclipses, but no one could ever confirm or find evidence for that. The theory of Vulcan was left waiting for some better times. Einstein had a different idea. You know about his theory of general relativity, right? That's where he claimed gravity wasn't some sort of natural force, but a result of space-time curved because of the presence of giant space objects, like planets and stars. Planets circle around the Sun in their usual orbit because space-time is curved. That means the planets are kind of falling towards the central star of our solar system. And Einstein tried to explain Mercury's unusual orbit using his own theory of relativity. Unlike the other planets in our solar system, Mercury's orbit wasn't that circular. Instead, it seemed to wobble slightly, as if there was an invisible force pulling it away. 
Einstein said this could be happening because the massive gravity of our sun was actually curving the fabric of space-time around it. He claimed it's possible this changed Mercury's orbit a little bit. It took the scientific community a while to test this theory, but it eventually seemed like the most plausible explanation. Even though Einstein's theory gave us a more elegant explanation for Mercury's strange orbit, some scientists were still holding out hope for Vulcan. It was especially hard to let go of the idea of Vulcan because Mercury is also the planet that's really hard to see from where we're standing. But later, more and more scientists started accepting Einstein's theory above their imagination. And they would observe a total solar eclipse specifically to test Einstein's theory of relativity, not because of Vulcan. And Vulcan is not the only hypothetical planet everyone was talking about. In the newer age, some believe there could be a mysterious planet lurking in the outer part of our solar system. But this one is more likely to exist. No one has seen it directly yet, but computer simulations show this so-called Planet 9, or Planet X, is probably somewhere there beyond Neptune. Neptune and Planet X could be similar in size. Planet X could be 10 times more massive than Earth and circles around our Sun in an elongated shape which is, on average, 20 times farther from the Sun than Neptune. A year there may last between 10,000 to 20,000 Earth years. By comparison, a year on Neptune lasts 165 Earth years. Something this big moving out there beyond Neptune could explain the unusual orbits of smaller objects in the Kuiper Belt. The Kuiper Belt is the area of our solar system beyond Neptune and where it orbits. And there are most likely many asteroids, comets, and some other smaller bodies there, mostly made of ice. There was another hypothetical planet called Nibiru. Remember those rumors that the world could end back in 2012? One of the popular scenarios was Nibiru, which some claimed would hit our home planet at the end of the year. Of course, nothing happened. We're still here, all set and good, but the idea of Nibiru seemed interesting. Stories started in the 1970s when a man named Zachariah Sitchin mentioned Nibiru in his book, The Twelfth Planet, claiming it orbits the Sun every 3,600 years. But there's no chance a planet with such an eccentric orbit wouldn't disrupt other planets in our solar system with its gravity. And if it was really coming that close to Earth in 2012, we were supposed to be able to see it with the naked eye. Some simple calculations showed Nibiru would have been nearly as bright as Mars at its dimmest and brighter than the faintest stars you see from a city. Oh well, maybe we'll have more luck in the next 3,500 and something years. In 2011, a comet named Elenin appeared that many people thought could be Nibiru. But when you're looking at comets and planets through a telescope, you see they appear differently. A comet has a coma which is a gas atmosphere, together with a tail, something a planet doesn't have. Plus, this comet didn't slam into the Earth. It came too close to our Sun and fell apart. The leftover pieces will continue moving on their way to the outer solar system for the next 12,000 years. Dark, mysterious, cold space. Comets, asteroids, planets, stars, and something that's lurking over there, far beyond Pluto. Yup, this could be the ninth planet of our solar system, the one people have been wondering about for centuries. IRAs, which stands for the Infrared Astronomical Satellite, collected interesting data back in 1983. It could be proof that Planet 9 is hiding there. No one knows if it really exists, but this discovery helped to build a model to understand this potential planet better. And in 2016, scientists found out that some small space objects in the Kuiper Belt were orbiting a bit oddly. The Kuiper Belt is the outer area of our solar system. It's a ring in the shape of a donut, filled with leftovers from the times when our solar system was forming. You can find this donut beyond Neptune. The objects in that region of space have weird orbits, almost as if a big body with strong gravity is pushing them away. Knock knock, Planet 9 again! The theory says it might be 5 to 10 times the mass of our own planet, and up to 20 times further away than Neptune. 
The astronomical unit equals the distance between our planet and the Sun. Pluto is approximately 40 astronomical units from the Sun. But Planet 9, if it exists, is 400 to 800 astronomical units away. It would take 10,000 to 20,000 Earth years for this mysterious planet to make a single circle around the Sun. This makes it harder for us to catch the space body. There's a theory Planet 9 may have formed between the orbits of Jupiter and Neptune, similar to the rest of the gas giants in our solar system. The gravitational force of one of the two huge planets probably kicked it out of its orbit. Oh no! Then Planet 9 could get ejected further away from the eight planets we know about. It ended up as some sort of icy waste, quite small at the beginning. But as time went by, Planet 9 has cleared its orbit of frozen pieces of rock and dust and finally formed into a real planet. Another theory says that this could be a planet another star lost on its way while it was passing near our solar system. In any case, Planet 9 probably doesn't reflect that much sunlight since it's so far away. And astronomers aren't sure where exactly they should look for it. Space is dark, mysterious, endless, obviously. But if we do find Planet 9, it will be the first solid proof there are more planets in our solar system than we thought. Moving on to an interesting exoplanet, located only 90 light years away from us. An exoplanet is generally a planet located outside our solar system. This one has an atmosphere with water clouds. One year there lasts 24 Earth days. And the planet travels around a red dwarf star, which is way dimmer and smaller than our Sun. That's why, even though the planet is 8 times closer to its star than we are to our Sun, the temperature there is similar to that on our planet. This exoplanet has a size similar to Neptune. It's also less dense, which means it's mostly made of gas, unlike Earth, which is made of rock. The average temperatures there is 140 degrees, which makes it one of the coolest small exoplanets we've ever discovered. And the cooler the exoplanet is, the bigger the chance we'll find clouds in its atmosphere. Researchers have discovered more than 4,000 exoplanets. But all of them have been found within the Milky Way, at least until now. For the first time, astronomers may have spotted a planet outside our galaxy. They called it M51 ULS-1. Hmm. The planet is located in the Whirlpool Galaxy, a distant spiral galaxy 28 million light-years away from us. There was once a huge but pretty young star that got stuck in a gravitational dance with something that could be a dense neutron star, the collapsed core of a giant star, or a black hole. The star's dance partner had incredibly strong gravity. It was feeding on the star, greedily ripping away its plasma. Then something unusual happened. An unknown, maybe even Saturn-sized object passed by and blocked this confrontation from our solar system. Now no one can see what is going on. But this could potentially be the farthest planet we've ever discovered. There's a newly discovered planet outside our solar system. As large as Jupiter, it orbits two stars. And, as we can observe it from our planet, it crosses in front of them both. The full circle around these two stars, which means one year, takes approximately 200 Earth days. On the day of the discovery of the previous planet, scientists also found it had an unusual companion. It's an extra-hot Jupiter with an ultra-tight orbit around its star. The year there lasts only 1.9 Earth days. This planet has a weirdly shaped orbit. Also, it travels in the opposite direction from the rotation of its star. If you could travel 57 light years away from our planet, you'd see something pink lurking in the darkness. As you get closer, it becomes bigger and more fascinating. Yup, it's a magenta colored planet. A few billion miles away from its sun, this guy is one of the youngest planets scientists have discovered. It's only 100 to 200 million years old. It's made of pink gas, similar to our Jupiter. So if you could fly closer to its surface, this gas would envelop you like a thick fog. You're coming closer and going deeper, and the gas is becoming darker, getting a reddish shade. And look at the planet's core. It's super hot. Because of its high temperature of 460 degrees Fahrenheit, this planet is like an oven. The heat is the reason the planet glows so brightly. You'll also notice the sky is hazy pink, with clouds made of droplets of frozen water, similar to ours. There's another exoplanet half as massive as Earth, which is one of the smallest planets we've ever found outside our solar system. It has a diameter of 5,600 miles. 
For comparison, Earth's diameter is 7,900 miles. The planet in question is mostly made of iron, similar to Mercury. Mercury has a massive iron core and a very thin crust, which makes it an oddball in our solar system. At its early stages, it collided with some space body at least once. That collision pulled its outer layers away, which is why only the firm iron core remained. Maybe this exoplanet participated in a huge space crash too. That's what probably took away the planet's mantle and left mostly its iron core. Or maybe this is just a remnant of a gaseous planet that used to be the size of Neptune. The atmosphere of the planet could be blown away by, let's say, a huge amount of radiation coming from the star. This planet is only 31 light years away from us, and the day there is less than 8 Earth hours long. The planet is only a little bit bigger than Mars. People aren't likely to ever settle in that place because of its extreme temperatures that go up to 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit. There might even be molten lava on the side of the planet that faces its star. Such temperatures are high enough to evaporate any atmosphere, so this planet might have had one in the past. Generally, gas giants like Jupiter can't support life because they have extreme weather conditions, temperature, and pressure. And there are no building blocks that might create life. But smaller terrestrial planets, such as, I don't know, Earth, have more key ingredients like oxygen and liquid water. Plus, they have more temperate weather and other conditions. And still, not all of such planets support life, of course. It's not easy to find a planet with similar conditions as the ones we have on Earth, or at least the conditions that would allow life to develop there. But meet Kepler-22b, one of our most promising findings. It's 600 light years away from us, twice bigger than our planet, and with temperatures of about 72 degrees Fahrenheit. This is a so-called super-Earth. It's a category of planets unlike any we have in the solar system. They're more massive than Earth, but still lighter than ice giants such as Uranus or Neptune. Super-Earths can consist of rock, gas, or a mixture of these two. Kepler-22b is within the habitable zone of its parent star, which is less bright than our sun. The planet probably has a rocky core. It may have an ocean, but it doesn't host any life. At least, we don't know about it yet. While we may think of ourselves as advanced after catching a glimpse of the eight planets of our solar system and their 200 moons, we really have little idea of what's out there. So much so that there's speculation that there might be one more planet in our solar system. Scientists call it Planet X or Planet 9. This undiscovered world could be hidden way out past Neptune. Asteroids and dwarf planets in this area have weirdly unexplained altered orbits, and Planet X may be the reason. Tales of this mysterious planet began over a hundred years ago with a man called Percival Lowell. Lowell had a great love of space, and aside from having an impressive mustache, he was also super rich. Ooh, that lucky guy! He used his riches to build an observatory in Arizona. He then dedicated it to study the odd motions of Uranus and Neptune. Their gravitational pulls are slower than those of all the other planets in our solar system, almost as if there is a giant hidden object pulling them off course. In 1906, Lowell theorized that there could be another planet out beyond Neptune. It probably caused those strange cosmic happenings. The man called this potential space body Planet X. In 1930, Pluto was discovered by Clyde Tombaugh at Lowell's very own observatory. It finally looked like people had an explanation for the weird orbital patterns. Lowell's team was on cloud 9 after the discovery, but their celebrations were short-lived. Soon, they found out that Pluto is way too small to be having that much of an effect on the surrounding planets. And it was also too far away from them, so it was back to the drawing board. Planet X, if it exists, is 10 times the size of Earth and 4 times its radius. It would take at least 10,000 years for the planet to orbit the Sun, and it would sit over 200 times further out than our home planet. That's 600 astronomical units from the center of the solar system. FYI, an astronomical unit equals the distance between the Earth and the Sun. But while that sounds super far away, it's actually not. The distance between space bodies is usually measured in light-years, 
and an astronomical unit is a much smaller unit of measurement. For context, the most distant thing detected from Earth is the galaxy GNZ11. Cute name, huh? It sits a staggering 32 billion light years away. Even so, our telescopes can still spot it. And just one light year is the same as 63,241 astronomical units. Woo! So, if our tech can detect a galaxy that's so far away, how have we not been able to uncover Planet X? Well, it's probably down to the fact that it might not even exist. The theory of Planet X was pretty much debunked back in 1989. It was discovered that the mysterious gravitational pulls of Neptune had been a red herring all along. Scientists had massively misjudged just how big Neptune actually was. Voyager 2 visited the planet and discovered its actual size. This new info explained the odd gravitational pulls, meaning they weren't being caused by the so-called Planet X. But that's not where our investigation ends, as the hypothetical ninth planet once again popped up around 10 years ago. While the evidence behind Lowell's theory was wrong, his belief in Planet X may not have been. In 2015, astronomers Michael Brown and Konstantin Batigin discovered that there were, in fact, unexplained gravitational forces at play past Neptune. There are satellites that orbit planets perpendicularly, which doesn't happen anywhere else in our solar system. There's also clusters of asteroids that move in very specific ways. So specific that it's basically impossible that it could be random. Even weirder, there are satellites that travel in completely opposite direction to the Sun, unlike most other things in the solar system. A planetoid called Sedna also appears to be being pulled towards something, along with six others, all going in the same direction. And Brown and Batigin aren't just any other stargazers. They're both well-respected scientists at the top of their game. Konstantin Batigin has been named in Forbes as one of 30 scientists who are changing the world. And Mike Brown was the man who rebranded Pluto as a dwarf planet. This means that when these guys say something, it's usually pretty legit, and you should probably listen. But the only way we can really prove Planet X exists is to actually find it, and this has turned out to be pretty difficult. To locate the planet, we'd need to use a method called transit photometry. This is basically where we monitor a whole bunch of stars for a long time and look out for any dips in the light they give off. These dips would likely be caused by a planet getting in the way. And ta-da! The existence of Planet X could be proved. But for this method to work, Earth, the new planet, and the Sun all have to be perfectly aligned. These circumstances are pretty rare. And if these conditions don't exist, the dip in light won't happen. Plus, this method would only really work with planets that are closer to the Sun than our Earth. That's Venus and Mercury. For anything past Earth, this technique is pretty much useless. Another technique we could use is to find the potential planet through a good old-fashioned telescope. But as you can imagine, that's insanely tricky. The furthest object that we've found in our solar system is a planetoid, appropriately named, far, far out. But that's only 140 AU away from the Sun. That's only like a quarter of the way to Planet X. We can only see an object because of its brightness. The Sun is very visible to us because it emits huge amounts of light. And we can see the Moon because it reflects the Sun's light. Technically, the Moon has no right to appear brighter than everything else in the night sky. It only seems brighter because we're closer to it. The farther away an object is, the less bright it appears to us. The major issue with seeing the theoretical Planet X is that all objects in our solar system get their light from the Sun. They reflect sunlight, and that's why we can see them. Given how far away from the Sun Planet X might be, it makes it nearly impossible to see. And because of its really dim light, to view it, we would require perfect weather conditions as well as an extremely strong telescope. But Brown and Batigin have found the perfect one. The Subaru Telescope is located at the top of a dormant volcano in Hawaii. It's huge and is capable of capturing even the weakest light from distant space objects. The issue that we need to figure out is where to point it. 
without knowing where Planet X actually is, this basically turns things into a giant guessing game. There are also only around three nights every year when the conditions are clear enough to see the hypothetical Planet X. It's difficult, but not impossible. And still, most astronomers have called it a day and agree that Planet X doesn't exist, stating that it's just a common myth. The most widespread explanation for the weird gravitational pulls is that there's a tiny black hole in our solar system. It's pulling the planets toward us. But don't worry. They say it's not big enough to actually munch on a planet. So Earth is all good, for now. The issue with the black hole theory is that, once again, it's almost impossible for us to track the thing down. While its mass could be as great as that of Planet X, the hole itself would be squished down to the size of an orange. Telescopes wouldn't be of any use. To find it, people would have to look for the gamma rays sent off by objects as they fall into the black hole. Another way we could find it is to release hundreds of tiny spacecraft. They would pass close enough to the hypothetical hole, and when they got pulled toward it, we could probably detect it. But don't count out Brown and Batigen's theory. It's still being documented by NASA. And until we find unmistakable evidence to prove any theories, Planet X might still be out there. Our solar system might have some more planets up its sleeve. We know about eight official planets, but they're not the only ones that survived the chaotic formation of our solar system 4.5 billion years ago. Astronomers say there are three categories of planets in our solar system. We're in the first one, the four rocky inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, that peacefully orbit the Sun. They're located within the main asteroid belt that separates Mars from Jupiter, which is in category number two. That one's a group of planets in the outer solar system, the gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. These planets have huge amounts of ice and gas around what scientists believe to be their rocky cores. The third group lies beyond the area where our local planets are, somewhere further than Neptune. It's the realm where you'll find dwarf planets such as Pluto, Eris, and Sedna, and many smaller space bodies like comets. But new findings say there could be something else lurking in the dark besides dwarf planets and tiny space bodies. Maybe even a new planet! Models scientists made say that our solar system used to have one or more rocky planets the size of Mars or Earth. Over time, these rocky wanderers interacted with the wide gravity fields of our gas giants. This kicked them into a far-out orbit, away from the neighborhood. The question is if one of those Mars-sized planets survived and could really be somewhere out there. Scientists have made simulations to see what potentially happened. These showed that in half of such cases where planets interact with the gravity of gas giants, they get ejected into interstellar space. In the remaining half, there's this one rogue planet left in an orbit similar to the ones the Kuiper Belt objects are following. There's only one thing left to do now. Find it. Astronomers found the loneliest planet in the universe. They were trying to find distant brown dwarf stars, or failed stars, ones that never become massive enough to start shining. Stars are born with big masses, which means they also have strong self-gravity. The star squeezes in on itself. That causes high internal temperatures and enables the star to shine. But instead, they found a lonely wanderer, CFBD SIR 2149. The planet is between 50 and 120 million years old and has a surface temperature of 750 degrees Fahrenheit. Compared to stars, that's cold. At first, scientists thought it could be a brown dwarf star, but in that case, it would be way older. This starless planet floats around through space, passing only 130 light years away from our planet. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, is 100,000 light years wide, so that's relatively close. The lonely traveler is actually a gas giant, four to seven times bigger than Jupiter. Maybe it was kicked out from its own solar system because of gravitational forces, or getting into another planet's orbit, or it was formed away from its parent star. Far beyond Pluto, on the edge of our solar system, there's a space body about as big as Pluto, but a little bit colder and way denser. 
It's probably a big rocky body covered in a thin icy mantle. It's the dwarf planet Eris. Both Pluto and Eris occupy the Kuiper Belt, which is the distant ring of frigid space bodies that lies beyond Neptune. A day there lasts 25.9 hours, pretty similar to Earth. But Eris circles our Sun in the distance three times farther than Pluto, which means its year is pretty long, 557 Earth years. Eris has a bright, icy surface. It's one of the most reflective bodies in our solar system. It bounces back more than 95% of the light that strikes it. Somewhere out there, even farther, there's a super Saturn, J1407b, much larger than Jupiter or Saturn. It's an exoplanet, which means a planet that orbits a star other than our Sun. Super Saturn is 434 light years away from Earth in the constellation of Centaurus. It's the only exoplanet we know about with rings similar to Saturn. It actually has a huge ring system, 200 times bigger than Saturn's rings. There are more than 30 rings, each of them tens of millions of miles in diameter. There are gaps in the rings, which means there could be some interesting satellites, exomoons, around. If this super Saturn could swap places with our regular Saturn, its rings would absolutely dominate our sky. You could look up and easily see them. The view would be amazing because they would appear much bigger than a full moon. Scientists have found thousands of planets outside of our solar system. Some are dense as iron, while others are airy and light. And then there's the water world, GJ1214b, a steamy world, bigger than Earth and smaller than Uranus, 40 light years away from us in the constellation of Ophiuchus. It's a watery planet surrounded by a thick atmosphere, 2.7 times Earth's diameter and almost seven times heavier than our home planet. It was most likely formed somewhere farther from its star, where there was plenty of water ice, but later migrated to where it is today. Its surface temperature is 440 degrees Fahrenheit, which is too hot to host life like on Earth. It also has much less rock and much more water than our planet. Imagine a planet with no land, but only endless oceans covering all of its surface. High pressures and temperatures would form things like superfluid water or hot ice some pretty exotic materials that we can't see on our planet. Gliese 436b. It's a Neptune-sized exoplanet 30 light years away from our planet in the constellation of Leo. It makes one full orbit around its star in a little more than two days. This planet defies the laws of physics. It orbits its star, Gliese 436, which is smaller, cooler, and less luminous than our sun, at a distance 15 times closer than Mercury is to the sun. When we typically think of ice, we picture a frozen cube. But this planet has an icy surface, even though the temperature there is 980 degrees Fahrenheit. This temperature is way above the melting point, but the ice remains solid and burning hot. This happens because of very strong gravity. It compresses the water vapor in the atmosphere into solid ice. The pressure here doesn't allow the ice to melt, no matter how hot the surface is. Now imagine being on a mysterious planet and it suddenly starts raining sapphires and rubies. One distant exoplanet, Hat P7b, a gas giant 1,000 light years away from Earth in the constellation of Cygnus and 16 times bigger, has specific weather and pretty violent storms. Rubies and sapphires are scattered across the planet when it's raining. On the planet's night side, there's a high amount of corundum in the atmosphere and corundum is what mineral gems such as sapphires and rubies are made of. Clouds of corundum give such an amazing view. The planet is plagued by severe winds that often turn into powerful storms that push huge masses of those clouds across the planet. Although the planet is uninhabitable, it would certainly be cool to come there and pick up some gems. Still, the weather is pretty wild. Plus, the temperatures are over 4,600 degrees Fahrenheit. By comparison, Venus is the hottest planet in our solar system, and its temperature is only 900 degrees Fahrenheit. Looking over the expanse of space, you can see a beautiful little blue dot in the endless darkness. It's an exoplanet, HD 189733b, that lies 63 light years from us in the constellation of Volpecula. But it's way hotter and larger than our planet, 
around the size of Jupiter, and it completes its orbit around its host star in only 2.2 Earth days. That orbit is so close that the planet is most likely tidally locked. That means it's always showing only one face to its star, like our moon always shows one side to Earth. The weather here is crazy. The winds blow at up to 5,400 miles per hour, which is seven times the speed of sound. The fastest wind on Earth only hit the mark of 230 miles per hour. And it gets better. The rain here is not made of water, but of molten glass. Clouds are made of silicate atoms and particles. They are the key element that gives the planet its cobalt blue color, not the reflection of oceans, which is the case with Earth. Earth used to be purple. Today, even when you look at our planet from space, you see a lot of green. The green we see in nature is there because of photosynthesis, the process where plants transform energy coming from the sun into energy they need to live and to produce oxygen for us. The main part of the process that gives plants the green color is the chlorophyll pigment. A long time ago, instead of chlorophyll, there was a molecule called retinol. Its pigments absorb yellow and green light and turn it into red and blue. So the Earth was more purple. And then there's a pink planet, GJ504b, far away from us, in the Virgo constellation, four times more massive than Jupiter. It's a newly formed exoplanet, around 160 million years old. By comparison, the Earth is 4.5 billion years old. If we could go there, we would see an incredible world that glows from the heat of its formation. Everything around you would be colored magenta. At the edge of our solar system, there's a cold and mysterious region known as the Oort Cloud. It's a hypothetical vast area of icy space objects surrounding the sun. It's believed to lie far, far away from our star, from 2,000 to 5,000 astronomical units. For comparison, Pluto's orbit carries the planet between 30 and 50 astronomical units from the sun. And there, in this freezing emptiness, a rogue planet may be hiding right at the moment. At least, that's what new research has recently suggested. Rogue planets are called this way because they don't orbit around any star. They wander the galaxy alone, totally untethered. Without stars, they don't have days or nights, only eternal darkness. Rogue planets are usually kicked out of their planetary systems, doomed to a solitary existence of circling the center of the galaxy on their own. Of the thousands of planets scientists have detected outside of our solar system, only a dozen or so are starless and cruising on their own. At the same time, there might be billions or even trillions of rogue planets wandering around our galaxy. If these estimations are true, it might mean that the Milky Way contains more free-floating planets than stars. Anyway, in 1907, one astronomer started a search for Planet X. It's a hypothetical giant planet moving around the sun beyond the orbit of Neptune. The scientist was convinced that this planet existed because he had observed some irregularities in the orbits of Uranus and Neptune. His idea led to the discovery of Pluto in 1930. But the dwarf planet was too small to have any serious gravitational impact on the orbit of Neptune, let alone Uranus. These days, the Planet X theory is largely considered to be discredited, but it hasn't stopped astronomers from searching for planets in the far reaches of our solar system. And shockingly, a new study claims there might be one or even more out there, but much, much further away than predicted. An international team of scientists has recently simulated the unstable celestial mechanisms of the early solar system. They've discovered that there's a possibility that a few planet-sized bodies might have come to rest in the Oort cloud. You see, about 4.5 billion years ago, when the solar system was just forming, it was a hectic and unsettled place. Gravity sent debris from the cooling protoplanetary dust cloud hurtling around like cosmic tennis balls. From time to time, large chunks of this debris, even planet-sized ones, were sent flying far enough to escape the sun's gravity altogether. Such pieces of debris turned into rogue planets, 
researchers have seen such space wanderers in distant exoplanetary systems. But according to them, there's a 0.5% chance that one or more of those wayward planets formed in the solar system and ended up in the Oort cloud after drifting away from the sun. At the same time, it's slightly more likely that a rogue Neptune-like planet was snagged by the sun's gravity from another planetary system. And then, this planet came to rest somewhere in the Oort cloud. The chances that this scenario is true reach 7%. If this turns out to be the case, then a space body similar to Planet X might indeed be hiding out there, on the outskirts of our solar system. The only problem is that it would still be too far away to have any impact on Neptune's orbit. In any case, most researchers are convinced that the Oort cloud is made up of a collection of way smaller icy objects. But given the distance to the Oort cloud and its enormous size, we may never really figure out what is lurking out there. How about a mysterious object that used to orbit between Mars and Jupiter? At one point in the early days of the solar system, it was destroyed by some catastrophic event. This space body is called Phaeton, and this planet is totally hypothetical. But some people believe that the debris the planet left behind could have formed the asteroid belt. If you like this kind of content, please give it a non-hypothetical like and subscribe. Your support is very important to us. Thank you. Now, at the start of the 19th century, people hadn't discovered the asteroid belt yet. But in 1801, one astronomer spotted the largest asteroid in our solar system, Ceres. At that time, it was believed that a planet was orbiting between Mars and Jupiter, and Ceres seemed to be a suitable candidate. But the next year, another astronomer discovered one more space object with a similar orbit. It was an asteroid that was later named Pallas. These discoveries made scientists conclude that these two objects could have been fragments of the very planet that had once been dwelling between Mars and Jupiter. The following discovery of two more asteroids, Juno and Vesta, seemed to confirm this idea. Only in the 20th century did the hypothetical planet get its name, Phaeton. It was actually a name taken from Greek mythology, meaning Shining One. The hero with this name was the son of the sun deity, Helios, who rode his solar chariot across the sky every day, giving humans the heat and light necessary for survival. One day, Helios allowed Phaeton to drive his chariot. But the sun didn't manage to control the horses. Everything went wrong, and Earth was about to burn down. That's why the main deity, Zeus, had to stop Phaeton with a thunderbolt. The idea of the asteroid belt being the sad result of the planet's destruction was called the disruption theory. And of course, there were several ideas explaining the planet's tragic fate. The most obvious one is that Phaeton was hit by a large space object. It could be another hypothetical body called Nemesis. Some people believe that it's our sun's companion star. According to this theory, the sun has a small companion star that has an extremely elliptical orbit. This orbit periodically brings it close to the Oort cloud, a large sphere of icy objects surrounding the sun. This, in turn, causes a lot of mess. It might be the reason why this hypothetical companion star was also nicknamed the Death Star. It might be a red or brown dwarf. But whatever it is at the furthest point of its orbit, it's believed to be about 1.5 light years away. The search for this star has been in progress for decades. But no one has succeeded in locating this elusive and potentially non-existent space object. Anyway, back to Phaeton. Another theory claims that the planet could have suffered some internal cataclysm which tore it apart. But these days, the disruption theory has fallen out of favor. It was replaced by the accretion theory. According to it, the asteroid belt formed in the process of gradual buildup of particles initially floating in a gaseous environment. With time, they came together to create larger masses. Gravity pulled on these particles, encouraging them to stay together and form planetesimals, tiny planet-like bodies that later form real planets. Planetesimals kept colliding with one another, eventually developing into protoplanets. Such protoplanets grow until they form planetary bodies, 
As the mass of objects increases, the gravitational forces acting between particles become stronger too, continuing to build gas, dust, and ice within the nebular disk. It all has a snowball effect where the increase in mass results in more particles getting involved in the process. Eventually, there's no building material left, and large space objects float in the darkness of space. Now, many experts think that the asteroid belt is the remains of the protoplanetary disk which had once been orbiting the Sun before the planets formed. Unfortunately, it never had a chance to coalesce into a planet because Jupiter's gravitational effect prevented it from happening. In any case, even though Phaeton's was a good story, it's not popular anymore. The Hubble telescope orbits our planet, looking out at the big unknown universe. Since it's out of our atmosphere, the Hubble can see way further than telescopes on land. No clouds up there. This guy helped us confirm the theory about supermassive black holes in the center of galaxies. It also discovered a whole bunch of new galaxies, including the world's oldest one, which is about 8 billion years older than our own. But let's travel 25 light years away to another special star, Fomalhaut. It's one of the brightest stars in the night sky, and it's in the constellation Southern Fish. It's almost twice as big and heavy as the Sun. If you look at it from far away, you can see a bright yellow disk around it. It's a debris disk full of bits of space rock, and it's huge. Its width is about 25 times the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Scientists were curious about it. Was all this space dust going to get smushed together and become a planet one day? But then they saw something else. Right there, through all that debris, was a massive, mysterious object a large yellow dot orbiting the star. It looked like it was skating around a cosmic ice ring. So, in 2008, scientists announced they had discovered an exoplanet called Fomalhaut b. It was the first planet outside of our solar system that we could actually see with our own eyes. It's hard to know how heavy it is, probably like a couple of Marses put together, and it lives pretty far from its host star about four times the distance from the Sun to Neptune. One year on the planet would be the same as 1,700 Earth years. We'd all be babies over there. So, one question. Does the planet even really exist? Scientists sat around arguing about it. Then, in 2012, the trusty Hubble telescope came up with some new data. It was real all along. If it was a gas giant like Jupiter or Saturn, that would make it incredibly young, 10 times younger than Earth. And all that dust around it seems to shine non-stop. You'd have to wear sunglasses 24-7. But now, it's disappeared again. Nothing but a donut of debris. So? Maybe it was destroyed by a giant asteroid, like the one that wiped the dinosaurs off the face of the Earth. Or it may have been crushed by a rogue planet. These are planets that fly around the galaxy without a clear orbit. Maybe the dust is all that's left from a head-on collision. Or maybe something went crazy in the planet's core, and it exploded from within. Scientists now believe that Fomalhaut b was never actually a planet in the first place. It was just the leftovers of two big rocks smashing together. From far away, that kind of massive collision would actually just look like a yellow dot. These two colliding space rocks must have been at least 125 miles wide. That's like DC to Philadelphia wide. But this isn't the first time a planet's just up and disappeared from view. Scientists thought they'd found an Earth-sized planet orbiting our neighbor, Alpha Centauri. They called it Alpha Centauri BB. Not exactly flashy. Plus, in the end, it turned out it didn't exist. Oops. Scientists make mistakes, just like the rest of us. Not long ago, they thought there might be life on Venus. They found traces of a special gas, phosphine, which can be a sign of life. It was the top story for a month. But then, someone decided to double-check the data. There was some phosphine floating around, but not nearly as much as they thought. Travel back in time a couple of hundred years, and you can find even sillier mistakes. Back then, people believed that the Sun revolved around the Earth and that our planet was the center of the whole universe. That's because they didn't have fancy equipment to measure stuff. 
People saw the sun rise in the east and set in the west. That was enough to say that the sun revolved around us. So, what happened to that planet? Basically, the Hubble took a photo of the whole star system. But since it's so far away, the photo came out kind of blurry. Scientists just saw a large yellow dot and assumed it was a planet. Scientists don't usually get photos of far-off planets. They normally have to use math to find them. Space objects are in a constant dance with one another. The dance gives off a lot of energy, like gravitational energy and light energy. It's like this. Say your friend is hiding behind a corner. You can't see him, but you can see his shadow on the floor. It's kind of like what scientists do when they look out into the stars searching for planets. So, big deal, a planet vanished billions of miles from here. But what if our perfectly balanced solar system were to lose one of its planets? You better believe it would affect our lives. Mercury's up first. Good news, it's too small to have a gravitational effect on our planet. So we wouldn't even notice if it went missing. Next in line is Venus. This hot planet is sometimes called Earth's twin sister. It's completely uninhabited, of course. Other than that, Venus is one of the brightest spots in our night sky. Pull it out of the solar system and whoa, it's much darker at night. But still, not exactly a big deal. Mars. Life without Mars might even be good for the Earth. There's an asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Mars's gravity can grab an asteroid from the belt, spin it around, and catapult it toward us. Without Mars, the asteroids would stay in place thanks to Jupiter's gravity. Jupiter's heavier than all the planets in our solar system combined. It holds back the asteroid belt, and its gravity is actually strong enough to affect the Earth. A couple of thousand years after it disappears, we'd notice big changes. We'd move closer to the Sun, which means a couple of things. One, we'd have much hotter weather all year round, and two, our days, weeks, and years would be shorter. Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are all too far away for us to notice if they go missing. That just leaves one. No, not Pluto. What if the Moon disappeared? Basically, chaos. The Earth would tilt even more than it already does, and the weather worldwide would go crazy, even crazier than now. It might even lead to a new ice age. The Earth would start spinning a lot faster, so instead of 24 hours in a day, we might have anywhere between 6 to 12. And even though nights would be a whole lot shorter, they'd also be darker than ever. When we see the Moon, we're actually seeing the Sun reflecting its light off the Moon. And even a new moon is usually the brightest object in the night sky. If the sun were to disappear from our sky, it would be pretty much game over. This star is the center of our whole solar system. Without it, the orbits of all the planets would collapse, and we'd move around in complete chaos. The Earth, the moon, and all the other neighboring planets would just shoot out into the universe, heading for… well, we just don't know. Daytime would be a thing of the past. We'd need the sun for that. So it would be nighttime forever. We'd probably never see the moon again. We'd probably never see anything again. The Earth would get colder and colder, and all the water on the planet would gradually freeze. But what if the sun turned into a black hole? We might still orbit around it. Hopefully we're far enough away from it to stay safe. Mercury and Venus might be swallowed up, but we might get lucky. So we'd stay where we are, but we wouldn't have the sun to warm us. If it happened slowly enough, we might be able to adapt. We'd need a new power source, a new light source, and plants would have to adapt to get their energy from somewhere else. We'd probably need to build a huge tent-like thing over every city, forest, ocean. Or we might just jump ship and move to another planet. For decades now, scientists have been discovering new planets outside our solar system. By 2023, we've found more than 5,000 of them, and many of these exoplanets could potentially even have life. Now, if you're ready for a wild ride through space, let's find out what potentially habitable planets we've discovered in the last few years. LP890-9b and LP890-9c Buckle up, because we're heading to LP 890-9, a red dwarf star located a whopping 105 light years away from Earth. This star is quite cool compared to our Sun, in terms of temperature, of course. 
It has a temperature of about 4,700 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, this little guy may be small, but it's packed with surprises. For example, two exoplanets orbiting around it. Moreover, both of these planets are likely terrestrial, meaning they are rocky, just like Earth. First up, we have LP90-9b, which was discovered in 2022 using the TESS telescope and later confirmed by the Speculoos telescope. This planet is a super-Earth, weighing in at about 13 times the mass of our own planet. It's also slightly bigger than Earth, with a radius about 1.3 times larger. And if you thought Mercury's orbit around the Sun was quick, just wait until you hear about LP890-9b. It takes about three days to complete one lap around its star. Imagine falling asleep in freezing winter and waking up in hot summer. But the real showstopper here is LP890-9c. This one was discovered by the Speculoos Telescope. It's a bit further out from the star and takes a leisurely 2.5 times longer to orbit than LP890-9b. It's also a bit larger than Earth. But its real claim to fame is its location within the habitable zone of its star. That means it could potentially have liquid water on its surface and a climate suitable for life. Now this planet becomes a prime candidate for studying its atmosphere using the James Webb Space Telescope. But hold on, it's not all sunshine and rainbows for LP890-9C. It's also really close to its star, meaning it's full of radiation that could potentially make it less habitable. And to top it off, it's tidally locked, just like our moon. That means one side of the planet is always facing the star and is incredibly hot, while the other is always in the dark and really cold. Scientific models suggest that this planet could be more like Venus in terms of its atmosphere and climate. And Venus is, you know, isn't known for being human friendly. But despite these challenges, LP890-9c is still a fascinating exoplanet worth studying further. Who knows what secrets it may hold? Let's move on to the next candidates. GJ1002b and GJ1002c. An international team of scientists led by researchers at the Instituto de Astrofisica de Canarias has found two Earth-like planets just 16 light years away from our solar system. They both orbit a red dwarf star called GJ1002. Our sun is a yellow dwarf, which means that GJ1002 is much cooler and fainter than our own sun. But that's okay. Both planets are very close to its star, so it shouldn't be too cold or dark on them. These planets, called GJ1002b and GJ1002c, are both in the habitability zone of their star, meaning they could potentially support life. Also, both of them have masses similar to that of Earth. GJ1002b is the inner planet and takes about 10 days to orbit its star, while GJ1002c takes a little over 21 days. These planets are great candidates for studying their atmospheres and could even be targets for future missions to search for signs of life. The most important thing is that these two planets could potentially support life, and that's pretty cool. Plus, the fact that they're located so close to us means that we might be able to visit them someday. Well, maybe not us personally, but you know. And maybe one day, we'll even find some extraterrestrial life on one of these planets. Now that would be out of this world, but moving on to the next one. Kepler-1649c Kepler-1649c, also known as the Lost Exoplanet, was rediscovered in 2022 by scientists using data from NASA's Kepler spacecraft. This exoplanet is located about 300 light years away from Earth and orbits a small, cool star called Kepler-1649. It's about the same size as Earth, and just like the previous ones, it's located in the habitable zone of its star. Initially, the data about this planet was discarded. A special computer program called RoboVetter, written to automatically sift through the volumes of Kepler data, labeled this candidate as a false positive. In other words, the program thought it was just some kind of an error or interference. Fortunately, the researchers double-checked such things, 
and when rechecking the data, they managed to rescue poor Kepler 1649c. Now we know that this is a terrestrial planet just like Earth, and if it really does contain water, there could even be life there. But don't pack your bags just yet. There are still many unknowns about Kepler 1649c. For example, we don't know what its atmosphere is like or what kind of surface it has. It's also possible that the planet is tidally locked, just like LP 890-9c. That would be, uh, unpleasant. That's why Kepler 1649c is definitely worth further study. Maybe it turns out to be a perfect place for us to set up a vacation home in the future. Just make sure to bring plenty of sunscreen since the planet is pretty close to its star and things could get pretty toasty. Kepler 1638b. This exoplanet is located about 5,000 light years from Earth in the constellation Cygnus. It's also located in the habitable zone of its star. It was discovered in 2020 by the Kepler spacecraft through the process called transiting. They basically take a bunch of photos of the star at different times. After that, the programs analyze these photos and look for small spots and dots on them. These tiny dips in brightness may mean that a planet was passing by the star. Kepler 1638b is a bit of an oddball compared to most exoplanets we've found so far. It's about four times the mass of Earth and has a radius about two times that of Earth, making it a super Earth exoplanet. Its orbital period is about 260 days, which is quite close to our Earth, and that's great! Finally, at least somewhere, winter and summer will flow normally. Kepler 1638b could have some liquid water there. That's why it's also a good candidate for further study, to see if it could potentially support life. Let's hope that we'll find out more about this planet in the future. And finally, the last one. Kepler 438b Kepler 438b is an exoplanet located approximately 640 light years away from Earth in the constellation Lyra. It was discovered in 2015 by the Kepler Space Telescope. One of the most interesting things about Kepler 438b is its size and location. It's about the same size as Earth and also orbits within the habitable zone of its star. But there are a few catches. For one, Kepler 438b orbits around a red dwarf star, which are known for their high levels of solar radiation and flare-ups. This could make the surface of the planet too hostile for life as we know it. In addition, Kepler 438b has a much shorter year, only around 35 Earth days long. This could lead to extreme temperature fluctuations on the planet's surface, but maybe it's home to some hardy extraterrestrial life forms that have adapted to its unique conditions, or maybe not. Either way, it's definitely worth keeping an eye on. This is a small list of exoplanets that we've discovered in recent years. Now, with the use of new technologies, we'll be able to find new exoplanets much more often. Let's hope that at least a few of them will really be inhabited. Okay, here you are in the middle of the ocean. It's endless, but you can't see it because there's a thick fog all around you. Dense clouds hide the huge but dim sun. Is it day or night? You don't know. There's only a gray haze around you. You're alone. Even if you try to swim down, after several hours, you still won't be able to see the bottom of the ocean. And that's a typical water planet for you. I know, sounded kind of dark, but it's not that bad. These water worlds are more interesting than they may seem, so let's take a look at them. The ocean planet is a planet that consists, as you might have guessed, mainly of water, ice, and maybe some rocks. Think of the Earth's oceans, its horrifying depths, the Mariana Trench, and all that. And now, can you guess how much space all the water on Earth takes up? 0.025%, exactly. Now, just try to imagine a world of 40 to 60 percent water. If you dive in there, the depth can exceed 60 miles. Compared to that, the six mile depth of our Mariana Trench sounds like nothing. And yeah, the pressure there will be enormous. It can reach up to 20,000 Earth atmospheres. Very crushing. Now, it may sound scary, but it still would be great to find out more about these planets. 
Unfortunately, according to scientists' calculations, there may be a lot of such planets in our galaxy alone. Well, you don't have to go far. You can find these water guys even in our solar system. Not planets, of course, but moons. Jupiter has Ganymede and Callisto, and Saturn has Titan and Enceladus. The ocean can reach up to 30% of the mass of these moons, although it isn't clear whether these oceans are covered with a thick crust of ice. But we've discovered quite a few full-fledged ocean planets. This is because the conditions in which these planets may exist are very specific. For example, this planet should be somewhere 6 to 8 times larger than the Earth. If it's smaller, it'll have a rocky surface. But if it's bigger, it'll turn into a gas giant. At the same time, it must be in the habitable zone of its star. A little further, and the planet immediately turns into an icy giant or a cold super-Earth. So yeah, these guys are very picky. We first started exploring these planets back in the 1970s. However, since then, we found only a couple of them. But they're still very interesting. The first planet is Gliese 1214b. It was the very first ocean planet that we discovered. Initially, the scientists noticed only a small, dim dot. This dot turned out to be the red dwarf star Gliese 1214, an unremarkable, completely ordinary star that's five times smaller than our Sun and 300 times dimmer. Scientists wouldn't worry about it at all, but back in 2009, they noticed that this star had one single planet. And this planet turned out to be quite strange. This super-Earth was 2.5 times bigger than our Earth and 6.5 times heavier. But at the same time, it had a very, very small density and about the same gravity as our planet. In other words, there were almost no rocks and metals on it. But it wasn't a gas giant either. So there was only one option left. It was covered in water and ice. And that's how we discovered the first ocean planet. Well, actually, we can only assume that it consists of water. That's what the mathematical calculations say. In reality, this planet is quite confusing. It's difficult to explore, and so far, scientists haven't been able to find anything there. No hydrogen, no helium, no water, nada. That's because the outer layer of the atmosphere of this planet is very dense, and it perfectly hides its composition. But even so, it's probably a water world. Gliese 1214b is very close to its star. It's only 0.014 astronomical units away, which is less than the distance between the Moon and us. The year there lasts about 36 hours, and the temperatures, to put it mildly, are just wild. Scientists suggest that the average temperature there can reach 250 to 535 degrees Fahrenheit. Woo, that's hot! Remember the creepy description from the beginning? Well, actually, spending time on Gliese 1214b would be a little different. More like swimming in a steam boiler. Because of such gigantic temperatures, the ocean on the surface will be constantly in a state close to boiling without actually reaching it. So, imagine that you're descending to the surface of this planet, flying through clouds of steam. And then, you suddenly find yourself in the water. What? But when did it happen? Well, that's because the boundary between steam and water on Gliese 1214b will be very blurred. Of course, you won't be able to swim to the bottom of this ocean. But most likely, this bottom is covered with a very thick layer of so-called hot ice. It's like regular ice, but it doesn't really care about the laws of physics, so it just doesn't melt even at gigantic temperatures. And the thickness of this ice can reach as much as 3,000 miles. So that's it for the creepy Gliese 1214b. And not an Airbnb in sight! Now, although we can't 100% guarantee that it's a water world, we still have another candidate for this position. A newly discovered planet called TOI 1452b. This planet, located in the Dragon constellation, is almost 100 light years away from us. It was discovered using the TESS telescope by a group of researchers from the University of Montreal. This planet also belongs to the class of super-Earths. It's 7 times larger than our planet, but 48 times heavier. Again, all this is at a very low density. Because of this, scientists have suggested that almost the entire planet consists of a giant ocean. Here, we were a little luckier. This world won't be just a giant puddle and some thick ice. On this planet, there's probably a rocky surface deep under the water, just like in a typical ocean. 
Don't get too excited, though. This ocean will certainly be very different from what we're used to. TOI 1452b also orbits a small red dwarf. And not even one, but two at once. At the same time, if the previous planet was close to its sun, then this one, on the contrary, is very, very far away. It's two and a half times farther from its stars than Pluto is from the sun. And it moves at great speed. A year there lasts only 11 days. But we still don't know many things about this planet. We'll probably get some new information when scientists observe it from the James Webb Telescope. Well, that's it. Wait, did you expect something else? All right, all right, I know the question that bothers you the most. Can there be life? Well, this is a difficult question. We all know that water means life, and besides, these planets are in the habitable zones of their stars. So, potentially, yes, there might be life. Not some full-fledged civilizations, of course, but bacteria, fish, and some creepy giant monsters. I mean, you know, why not? However, this is very unlikely. Water alone isn't enough to create life, even though it's very important. There should also be some microelements and some minerals. And unfortunately, for most water planets, the composition will only consist of water and very thick ice. There won't be any minerals there. But don't give up. There's still some probability. First of all, there are meteorites and comets. They can bring the necessary minerals to the planet. The more often they crash into it, the higher the probability that they'll bring something like this into the ocean and thus create life. Secondly, TOI 1452b actually has these minerals. Yes, we don't know how deep the rocky bottom is located there. But if it exists, then surely something could have originated there. Let's hope that new research with powerful telescopes will allow us to find out the truth. And who knows? Maybe one day we'll be able to visit such a planet ourselves. We've discovered Kepler 22b, a small exoplanet in the Cygnus constellation. Seems like nothing important, right? But it's actually a big deal. This is the first planet located in the habitable zone that was found by the Kepler telescope. In other words, there may be water on this planet. And if there's water, there may be life. Kepler 22b can become our new potential home. So let's take a closer look at it. Actually, discovering new planets is not easy at all. Not all of them can be seen through our super cool telescopes, even the almighty Hubble. Sometimes the stars are so small and dim that it's really hard to find them on a map. The same thing happened with Kepler 22. In such cases, scientists have to use a special method. First, they take a bunch of photos of the star in different periods of time. Then, they look at them and think, hmm, are there any dark dots on this star somewhere? And if they find one, that might be a planet. These photos actually help us to discover some very important stuff. Like, first of all, this planet exists. Secondly, here is its size, radius, and proximity to the star. And finally, will we be able to live there? Now we know that Kepler 22b is very similar to our planet and could potentially become a second Earth. It's also very close to us, only 635 light years away. Yeah, it's about three quadrillion miles, but this is one of the closest options. Kepler 22, the star of Kepler 22b, is a yellow dwarf. It's very, very similar to our sun. The same size, the same radius, even the age is almost the same. 4 billion years. The difference is only in luminosity. It's about 20% dimmer than the sun. So, no matter how much you strain your eyes, you won't see this star in the night sky. The planet Kepler 22b is about 2.4 times larger than our Earth. And that's pretty good. More radius means more potential water and space to live. Although going from one city to another would take a while. It's scary to even imagine a three-day-long plane flight. We don't know the exact mass of this planet, but scientists think it's bigger than Earth's. Actually, the mass of Kepler-22b can be up to 36 times greater than that of our planet. What does it mean? Vigorous gravity. If the planet is 36 times heavier than Earth, then gravity there will be about six times stronger. 
Can you barely lift 20 pounds of potatoes? Try 120. Not to mention that you yourself can become much heavier on that planet. You'll have to get incredibly pumped up just to walk there. You have to literally turn yourself into a bodybuilder just to get to work. The worst thing is that, with such gravity, it'd be incredibly difficult for plants to survive there. They'd need at least a little freedom to rise up from the ground. And animals. Our dogs and cats would have to turn into little balls of muscle to survive there. But if this planet has its own animals or other inhabitants, we can roughly imagine what they may look like. They probably have a lot of legs to make moving easier. They aren't really tall, but they're very massive and extremely strong. Hmm, muscular giant spiders? Could be worse, I guess. The good news is that this is all unconfirmed information. If we're very lucky, and gravity there turns out to be just a bit stronger than Earth's, then, of course, it'll be much easier to live there. The next thing we know about Kepler-22b is that it's about 15% closer to its star than we are to the Sun. If Kepler-22b existed in our solar system, it would be located somewhere between Earth and Venus. Does that mean we're all going to burn? No, silly. As I mentioned before, the star Kepler-22 is pretty cold, just some 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's why we can assume that the temperatures on Kepler-22b will be about the same as we have on Earth. If the planet orbits its star the same way Earth orbits the Sun, which we don't actually know, Kepler-22b can rotate around its star on its side, like, for example, Uranus. What? Didn't you know Uranus is actually lying on its side? Also, look at its rings. Yes, Uranus also has rings, like Saturn, but they're vertical. The universe is truly a mysterious place. So, if Kepler-22b is really something like that, then the weather on the planet will be, to put it mildly, not very good. Incredibly cold winters will be regularly followed by hot summers. And, just like with tidally locked planets, we'd be able to live more or less comfortably only on the narrow piece of land between these two crazy sides. Let's hope that this is not the case and the planet rotates normally. But it's not all that bad. Studies show that there may be an ocean on Kepler-22b. You already know that water means life, but in this case, it's also a big plus because a planet covered by an ocean always has more stable temperatures. The water absorbs some of the heat and distributes it evenly across the planet. The hot parts cool down and the icy ones warm up. By the way, that's exactly what happened to Earth billions of years ago. When our planet started getting its first little puddles, our beloved moon helped these puddles to spread all over the planet. Thanks to this, a burning horror that used to be our Earth turned into a cute little ball full of life. So if Kepler-22b has water but no atmosphere, scientists think that the average temperature there could be around 12 degrees Fahrenheit. But if there's also an Earth-like atmosphere, then the temperature can reach 72 degrees Fahrenheit. That would be nice. And finally, one year there is equal to 290 Earth days, about nine months. The planet has no natural satellites, so unfortunately, we'd have to say goodbye to a beautiful view of the moon. On the bright side, we'd probably be able to see the sun as a distant little star. We could admire it in the night sky, remembering our home while not hiding from giant spiders. And this is all that we know at the moment. Unfortunately, it's quite difficult to explore such planets, so there's a lot of very important data that we don't know. For example, what kind of planet is this anyway? Yep, we're missing the most important information about Kepler-22b. We don't know if it's a rocky planet or not. And if not, then all the previously mentioned information means nothing. It may turn out to be a gas planet, or a planet covered with gas but with a solid core, like Neptune, or a water world covered with a giant ocean. In this case, it better be a water planet. Then at least we could build some kind of underwater city there. We could filter the water and eat fish, until we evolve into an amphibious species. Does it even count as evolution if we go back to our roots? 
Scientists, however, think that Kepler-22b may turn out to be a Neptune-like planet. Some astronomers have even assigned the planet to a category of mini-Neptunes. Yes, this is a real planetary category. But this hasn't been proven yet. But even if, fortunately for us, Kepler-22b turns out to be a rocky planet, we still don't know what the atmosphere is like there. Does it exist at all? What if it turns out to be something like the atmosphere of Venus, which is more toxic than your ex? Then we'd have to dig deep underground to somehow survive on this planet. And then we'd have to come up with a heat source, because it's pretty cold underground. Yeah, let's hope this won't be the case. There are many possibilities with Kepler-22b. So far, we don't have a clear answer. But let's hope that scientists will find it before we load the first people into shuttles and send them to conquer Kepler-22b. That would be awkward if it turns out to be a gas planet or something like that. The only life that we are certain about so far in the entire universe is on planet Earth. Whether that life is intelligent is, let's say, arguable. But anyway, it's not surprising that we're tirelessly searching for life on other planets. So far, they've discovered more than 4,000 of them. But what's even cooler? NASA has compiled a new list of 24 planets that aren't just Earth-like, they're better. The conditions on them are so good that they're more comfortable than on our planet. So let's examine some of them. KOI 5715.01 Hmm, let's be coy, shall we? <laughs> this wonderful planet is in the constellation Cygnus. And why is it so wonderful? Well, our sun is a yellow dwarf. And sorry, sun, even though you're not bad at supporting life, there are some stars that can do it better. Nothing personal. The planet Koi 5715.01 orbits near an orange dwarf. Orange dwarfs are stars slightly smaller than our sun and have a little lower luminosity. Uh, did you like the alliteration there? Anyway, don't worry, it doesn't mean we're going to live in complete darkness. In fact, if the planet is found closer to the Sun and it has a thicker atmosphere, it may even be lighter and more colorful than on Earth. Now, our Sun has a very short lifespan. Right now, it has 7 to 8 billion years left to live, a little longer than Earth's age. But orange dwarfs can live from 45 to 70 billion years. This is great not only because we'll be able to hang out on this planet longer, but also because the planets around these stars have more time to form life. Now, ideally, we would need to find a planet next to an orange dwarf that is about 7 billion years old. It's very likely there will be at least some organisms there. Koi 571501 is about 5.5 billion years old. Yeah, it may not seem mature enough, but that's okay, neither do I. Our Earth is a billion years younger, and that didn't stop us. The planet is quite close to its star and is in a habitable zone. One year there lasts 190 days. Imagine going to elementary school and already getting a driver's license. <laughs> it's almost two times larger than the Earth. The average temperature there is 52 degrees Fahrenheit, which is slightly less than ours, 57. But it mostly feels warmer there because strong gravity helps it hold on to heat in the atmosphere longer. It's a little too far away, though, like 3,000 light-years from Earth, which is about 18 quadrillion miles. Yep, better bring a really big lunch with you. Koi 3010.01 This planet is found next to the star Koi 2010. This planet sounds like a very pleasant world. The average temperature on this planet is 67 degrees, so a little warmer than ours. But that's a good thing. Scientists believe that on a perfect planet, the temperature should be just about 10 degrees hotter than on Earth. The more heat there is on the planet, the more comfortable it is to live there. Also, the higher chances of developing life. The radius of this planet is nearly one and a half times larger than Earth. There's some atmosphere, although we're not yet sure about its composition but it's probably like the Earth's. Scientists think that we'll find an ocean there, and it can cover up to 60% of the surface, which is also cool. In a perfect world, water and land should be distributed more evenly than on our planet. A little more land means a little more territory and resources, right? But listen, this planet is actually very similar to the Earth. The semblance is so striking 
that scientists believe we have an 84% chance to find life there. Of course, not necessarily an intelligent life, but at least some animals. Wouldn't that be cool? Now, what do you think they could look like? Hmm, very Earth-like planet, but with stronger gravity. Well, if someone lives there, they're probably big but have a small height and strong little legs. Sounds adorable. And scary. But we won't be able to find out the truth anytime soon. So far, for us, these planets are microscopic dots in space. We only have some dry, boring data about them and don't even know what they look like. We'll have to wait until we can find a way to get closer to these planets. Kepler-186f This is also one of the best candidates for having life. This rather cute planet was nicknamed the Earth's cousin because it does have a strong resemblance. Anyway, these two planets are like sisters, not twins. Kepler-186f rotates near a red dwarf. Red dwarfs are stars even dimmer and smaller than orange dwarfs. Yeah, they'll also live for a very, very long time, but their luminosity is also quite low. However, Kepler-186f is closer to its star than we're to our sun, so it shouldn't be too dark there. Well, at least not night-like dark. The sky on this planet is sure to be an unusual shade of red, like sunsets on Earth. What do you think? Would you like to live on a planet with an eternal sunset? The size of this planet is about the same as Earth. Not bad, not perfect. Why so? Because the coolest planets are those that are bigger than Earth and have stronger gravity. Now you'll probably say, but wouldn't it be harder to walk there and even harder to get out of bed on Monday? <laughs> of course! But on the other hand, this planet will pull the atmosphere better. The atmosphere will be thicker and denser. This means more protection from the scary space stuff, more oxygen, and more heat. Not to mention the fact that the bigger planets have more space to settle. Awesome, right? But of course, the Earth's size is also an excellent choice. Another cool fact is that the tilt of Kepler-186f is about the same as ours. It means that there should be stable seasons and a normal day-night cycle. Do you know how important the tilt of the planet is? Let's look at Mars. Mars is also, in fact, found in the habitable zone of our Sun. But its tilt is very unstable, and as a result, the entire ocean that could have been on it once now completely dried up. Today, it's just a red desert, and there's no life there. At least not as far as we know. But you see how important these tiny details are? This planet is also quite far away from us, 490 light years. That's about 3 quadrillion miles. So yeah, we're just going to keep waiting for intergalactic travel. Kepler-62e and 62f These planets were called the most Earth-like before we discovered Kepler-186f. They're very comparable to our home. Kepler-62e is about one and a half times larger than Earth, and Kepler-62f is just slightly smaller than that. They're located in the constellation Lyra, which is about 1,200 light-years away from us. They both also orbit a red dwarf. One year on Kepler-62e lasts about 122 days, even less than on that first planet we talked about. Scientists believe that both 62e and 62f are sort of water worlds. Warm places mostly, or even completely, covered with water. If there is land there, it's probably just some islands. Hmm, a world consisting entirely of islands. A fantasy dream for some, think Hawaii. And a nightmare for others, think Megalodon. But if you're a fan of ancient marine animals, just imagine how gigantic they could be there. Still, there are many things we don't know about this planet. Does it have a surface? What about its composition, density? One day, maybe we'll be able to answer these questions. And so, that's it for the super-Earths. Of course, the original list is much longer, and you can go check it out on the internet. Now, the best thing about all this is that these are planets that are better than the Earth. But we also know thousands of other exoplanets that are just close enough to ours. And the odds are, a few of them have at least some form of life. But they're very, very far away, so we have no way to check it out right now. Perhaps, down the road, we'll find some cool creatures on many of them. Our universe is full of both amazing and terrifying things. 
You already know about quasars, black holes, dark matter, and so on. But how about the horrors of space that you haven't even heard of? Would you like to visit the most bizarre worlds in the universe? And it's not me who made this list, but NASA themselves. Welcome to the Galaxy of Horrors, NASA's awesome Halloween collection. Please join me on a journey to some planets and tell me which ones you would consider the most horrible. Buckle up. Our first destination is a gas giant called Tress 2 b It's located 750 light years away from us. If we used a regular spaceship, it would take us about 10 million years to get there. Tress 2 b orbits a yellow dwarf, a star similar to our sun. It also weighs about 1.5 times more than Jupiter. So, what's so special about it? Well, if you're afraid of the dark, you definitely don't want to visit this place. It's the planet of eternal night, the darkest one of all the planets known to us. But it's not that far from its star, so why is that? The thing is, the surface of Tress 2b reflects light even worse than coal does. Because of this, it seems that there's no light at all. If you were flying across the surface of this planet, it would be like walking with a blindfold on your eyes. Oh wait, actually there is some light. An eerie deep red glow surrounds the surface of the planet. This glow is created by the burning atmosphere, which makes Tress 2b a scorching planet. The air there is even hotter than lava. Oh, but if you think that was bad, let me show you the next place of our horror journey. NASA wasn't beating about the bush while nicknaming this one. Now, we're not just talking about one planet, but three at once. They're also located quite far away, 2300 light years from the sun. We would have reached them by ship in about 35 million years. All the planets are in the constellation Virgo, and each is extremely light, much lighter than the Earth. These three exoplanets are called Poltergeist, Dragger, and Phobator. <laughs> cool names, huh? It's because each of these planets is about to become a ghost soon. The thing is, they don't revolve around a star, but around a pulsar. Pulsars are rotating neutron stars with an extremely powerful magnetic field. In simple words, these are the stars that exploded one day. After the explosion, they usually emit such a powerful pulse that it causes the star to rotate at an unimaginable speed. Several thousand rotations per second. At the same time, they constantly emit electromagnetic pulses that affect everything around them. So you've probably already guessed what's happening with our zombie planets. They're slowly, gradually being destroyed under the gigantic influence of radiation. One day, they'll disappear without a trace. Ghost-like planets orbiting an undead star? Yeah, zombie world is a fitting name. It's also not surprising that scientists nicknamed this pulsar Lich despite the long official name. Well, at least these guys stick together on their final dance. This planet has a long name, so bear with me. HD 189733b. This gas giant is 65 light years away from us. It would have taken around 1 million years to get there on a spaceship. HD, um, well, this planet is slightly more massive than Jupiter and orbits its star, an orange dwarf, all alone. At first glance, it may seem friendly. A pleasant blue color and curls on the surface. Kind of resembles a summer sky or foam on sea waves, right? Oh, looks are very deceptive, my friend. This planet has a pleasant cobalt blue color due to the hazy blowtorched atmosphere. This atmosphere contains silicates that condense when heated. In other words, the clouds on this planet have rain made of glass. Yes, it rains hot glass shards here. Oh, and if that's not enough, there's a raging wind on the surface, which is moving at a speed of 5,400 miles per hour. Just to compare, the fastest wind on Earth had a speed of 254 miles per hour, about 20 times weaker. And because of this, hundreds of thousands of glass shards rush horizontally across the planet's surface at breakneck speed. I really don't envy anyone who would want to try to land there. By the way, this isn't the only example of strange rains in our universe. For example, it rains molten iron on the planet Domitian. Or let's take so-called carbon planets. Their existence hasn't yet been proven, but if they do exist, 
There would be tons of black poisonous clouds, and it would rain pure gasoline and hot liquid asphalt. Oh, and also, raindrops would explode upon touching the surface. Eh, nothing special. The next planet, though, is actually really strange. It didn't just revolve around its star, it lived inside the star. This cosmic miracle is called Koi 55b, or Kepler 70b. This planet is very far away from us, 4,000 light years. It would take about 70 million years on a spaceship. It's twice as light as Earth and fully rotates around its star in just a couple of hours. A long time ago, it was an ordinary Earth-like planet about the size of Jupiter. It was peacefully and calmly orbiting its red dwarf star, Koi 55. But everything changed about 700 million years ago. Perhaps you've heard that in a couple billion years, our sun will begin to expand into a huge star, absorbing everything in its path. Well, this is the fate of red dwarfs. Sooner or later, they increase, turning into incredibly hot blue giants. The same thing happened with Koi 55. This star began to increase in size and heat up in temperature, gradually turning into a blue-white giant. It was ready to devour its nearest planets, but Koi 55b didn't care about it. When the star reached it, this planet just settled inside. And moreover, after some time, it left its star, simply returning to the new orbit. How was that even possible? Life inside its star turned Koi 55b into a red-hot round stone. It's one of the hottest planets we've discovered so far. The temperature on it reaches 12,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It's hotter than the sun, which is, let me remind you, an actual star. And for some reason, it's still alive and lives as if nothing happened. Unfortunately, sooner or later, the planet will disappear anyway. It's slowly evaporating itself due to the incandescent atmosphere. But still, it somehow managed to survive the journey through the star which isn't typical for regular planets, to put it mildly. I envy this willpower. However, not all planets are so lucky. Some are gradually being destroyed by their stars, and there is even an entire system among them. This last planet is a sad loner. It's located 870 light years away from us. The journey by ship to it would take about 25 million years. This planet is about 1.5 times more massive than Jupiter. This is a very sad, dark planet. A doomed gas giant, which is very similar to hot Jupiter, orbits its star all alone. At the same time, it's located so close to its star that its orbital period takes just one day. Of course, because of this proximity, the star gradually absorbs WASP-12b. The scorching heat of the star is slowly destroying and devouring the planet's atmosphere. The planet has only around 10 million years left. But what's more interesting, because of this stretching, WASP-12b acquired the shape of an egg. It doesn't even resemble an actual planet anymore. It's also very hot. The surface temperature of the gas giant reaches 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Also, a spectrograph of cosmic origin, or COS for short, found that the planet exchanges matter with its star. They're located so close that they give each other part of their chemical elements. This is a common phenomenon in closely spaced binary star systems, but this is the first time scientists have seen this in a star-planet relationship. What a unique system! To be honest, if I was guaranteed complete security, I'd be excited to visit at least some of them. What about you? Please let me know in the comments. So check this out. Astronomers have discovered an exoplanet they're calling Super Saturn. It's got rings over an AU wide. An AU is the astronomical unit, the distance between the Sun to the Earth. That's an incredibly huge ring system, hence its name. Super Saturn is being called Mamajek's object after the astronomer who led the team to whom we owe the discovery. Professor Eric Mamajek of Rochester University in New York found Super Saturn while scouring through data downloaded from wide-angle transit observations. WASP is the acronym for Wide Angle Search for Exoplanets. It's an ingenious project developed in the year 2000 by astronomers at Queen's University in Belfast, Northern Ireland and St. Andrew's University in Scotland. 
Using four telescopes, the CCD video cameras on the scopes record the slight dimming of starlight caused by objects passing in front of stars. This is called the transit method of exoplanet detection. So, for example, the planet Venus transits across our view of the Sun every couple hundred years. A black dot, the silhouette of Venus, is visible, crossing in front of the Sun as Venus passes between our line of sight and the Sun. This tiny eclipse causes the amount of sunlight coming to Earth to be reduced by a minuscule amount, also known as teeny tiny. The same is true for all the stars in the Milky Way that have planets going around them. Exoplanetary transits in front of stars must be in direct line of sight with Earth for the starlight to be dim. Such transits do not occur very often. That's why thousands of stars must be looked at simultaneously for as long of a duration as possible, between 4 and 8 hours a night. WASP was created to stare continuously at as wide of a range of stars as possible. Maybe one of them would show an exoplanet transit. That translates into a lot of data being produced, about 40 gigabytes per viewing session. Computer scientists at Leicester University in England developed a computer program to store the data and generate photometric graphs of the light intensity of each star. Open University, also in England, joined the WASP project, took this data, and made it available for research by astronomers worldwide. The graphs of the intensity of starlight show that changes in its brightness are called light curves. These graphs have two axes. One is in the timeline axis, the other one is the intensity of light. As the object, considered an exoplanet, though it could also be a brown dwarf star, crosses in front of the star, the timeline axis keeps track of how swiftly it is moving. It tells us how close the object is to the star, while the brightness axis keeps track of how much the starlight dims. This way, we can find out how large the object is. Now, obviously, big objects will dim the light more and be easier to detect. At present, Earth-based equipment is not sensitive enough to measure the dimming caused by planets as small as Earth. Neptune size and larger ones are the limit for WASP. However, the James Webb Space Telescope, which is now in operation, has a much greater sensitivity and will be able to resolve the transits of Earth-sized exoplanets. Now, I know you want me to get to Super Saturn, but there's something else you should be familiar with before we get there. If the exoplanet has an atmosphere, or in the case of Super Saturn, a ring system, the starlight from the star the planet is transiting will shine through the atmosphere or ring system, and that can be detected too. The light curve will show less dimming in the photometric data, because not all the starlight is being blocked. Some light is still getting through the atmosphere or rings. This is important because it gives astronomers a reading of the atmosphere. The James Webb Space Telescope is fitted with spectroscopes that can determine the gas content of the transiting exoplanet atmospheres – oxygen, methane, carbon, etc. The WASP project has been really catching on. There's a Super WASP project now consisting of WASP North and a WASP South. One looks at the sky above the Northern Hemisphere, the other looks at the sky above the Southern Hemisphere. There's also a Next Generation Transit Survey NGTS, based on the WASP project. It's automated, so astronomers don't have to stay up all night sipping coffee, but they can if they want to. Located at the European Southern Observatory in the Atacama Desert in Chile, the NGTS scans millions of stars and has discovered over a hundred exoplanets down to a size as small as three times the size of Earth. NGTS has started a planet hunters club on social media. Citizen scientists can search the online database of light curves and perhaps discover your very own exoplanet. What had been a strictly British effort started by one or two astronomers is now a worldwide phenomenon. With the ability to read the spectroscopic signatures of atmospheric gases during exoplanet transits, a new idea emerged – techno-signatures. That is specifically identifying gases in exoplanet atmospheres that are produced by civilizations. The James Webb Space Telescope can do this. Gases from pollution, such as chlorofluorocarbon CFCs, can be seen spectroscopically if present. 
Tritium from fusion reactions, if they have them, can also be detected, along with heat patterns from cities on the planet's surfaces. Technosignatures is a recent concept that originated after the WASP project started. Who knows what it will turn up? Now, let's get back to Super Saturn. The star that Super Saturn orbits is J1407, a small, dim, sun-like pre-main sequence star of the 13th magnitude. Huh? Well, the human eye can only see stars to about the 6th magnitude, and each magnitude is 2.5 times dimmer than the previous one. So it's not an exceptional star, just another telescopic star out there in the Scorpius-Centaur region of the night sky. J1407 is a young star that hasn't yet settled into its stable, long-duration phase. This is important because Super Saturn, officially J1407b, is showing signs of having a ring system in an early stage of development. Super Saturn's light curve was tucked away in the mountain of data from the Super Wasp project. Professor Eric Mamajak and his associate, Matthew Kenworthy of Leicester University, studied the data thoroughly and produced a detailed report on it. Knowledge depends on good data. The horizontal axis of J1407b's light curve, the time axis, is what's causing all the hubbub. It took Super Saturn weeks to transit across in front of its parent star. 56 days, to be exact. Planetary ring systems that we are familiar with in our solar system orbit right around the equators of the gas giant planets and are very thin, from only a few meters thick down to a few centimeters. In a telescope, Saturn's rings will seem to disappear when the planet is at zero inclination toward Earth. Saturn must be inclined at an angle in relation to Earth to see Saturn's beautiful ring system. It's something everyone should make a point of seeing. Saturn in a telescope. If Super Saturn's rings block most of the light from J1407 for 56 days, it means that the planet had to be orbiting at a steep inclination to its star. If it were at zero inclination, we wouldn't see the rings blocking any light. Therefore, the orbital time could be determined, 10 years minimum to 200 years if the orbit is highly elliptical. The superplanet itself is calculated to be 24 times the mass of Jupiter, which means that if it is gaseous, it could be a brown dwarf star. Super Saturn appears to have a Mars-sized object orbiting around it, because there is a huge gap in the rings that was most probably cleared out by a large object. The Cassini division in the rings of Saturn is where the moon Mimas has cleared out a path through Saturn's rings. The light curve of Super Saturn has only been observed once. All the exoplanet detection systems are keeping an eye out for it to come back around J1407. No one knows when that will occur. Some astronomers have suggested that J1407b is a brown dwarf star system in itself, merely passing in front of, but not connected to, star J1407. An orbital reappearance of Super Saturn would disprove that conjecture. The center region of Super Saturn blocked out all the light from its primary star. This is what indicates that the ring system is new and in an early developmental phase. Over time, the very dense ring mass close to the planet is expected to thin as all this matter gets absorbed into the planet or ejected into space. This is what has happened with our solar system's gas giant planets. The Mamajek object is a shocker. Never before or since has a light curve been detected like Super Saturn's. Super Saturn has added a new chapter to our understanding of the formation of ring systems. So, here's to you, Super Saturn. Hope to see you again soon. TRES 2b, or not to be, is a planet where night never ends. And it's not your regular night with stars shining in the beautiful skies. Here, it's pitch dark and scorching hot. TRES-2b is a gas giant, roughly one and a half times more massive than Jupiter, and its surface absorbs light better than charcoal. It might also have a faint dark red glow because of its burning air, which is as hot as fresh lava. Lovely. In the star system of 55 Cancri, there are five planets, four of which are gas giants similar to Jupiter and Saturn. But the fifth one, or rather the first, because it's closest to the star, is different in a most horrible way. 
55 Cancri E is so close to its sun that half the planet's surface is a literal ocean of molten lava. The other half is in eternal darkness because it never sees the sun. The planet is always turned to its star on one side. And between the scorching and the dark, there's the twilight zone, a thin strip of gloomy nothingness. That's a getaway spot. HD 189377b well, I'm not going to say that again, is the only exoplanet in the orbit of its star. And at first glance, it looks quite pretty, blue and white swirls making up wondrous patterns on the surface. But these pleasant colors actually come from hard silicate particles in the planet's atmosphere, which means it rains glass here. But the worst is that winds reach the speed of 5,400 miles per hour, or almost Mach 7. Well, for comparison, the fastest wind speed on Earth was 254 miles per hour, over 20 times less. Thus, the glass falling from the sky travels horizontally at hypersonic speeds, shredding everything in its path. Better duck! The next system, whose name I won't even try to pronounce, um, this one, has three exoplanets, which are all being slowly destroyed by their own star. It happens because that star is not a regular. It's a pulsar, a rapidly spinning core of an exploded star. It creates powerful electromagnetic pulses in several directions while rotating at several thousand times per second. As a result, the planets orbiting this deceased star are slowly being eaten away and will eventually disappear entirely. Kepler 70, hey, I can say that one, is a hot blue dwarf star that exploded into a red giant some 18 million years ago. At the time, it was orbited by at least two planets, the closer of which was a Jupiter-like gas giant. Its name was Kepler-70b, and it still exists. But the overgrown star consumed it and transformed it into a blazing hot rocky world. Right now, it's one of the hottest planets ever discovered. Its temperature is higher than the surface of our sun. It was lucky to survive spending time inside the star, but it's evaporating now and will probably be no more in the near future. WASP-12b is one of the weirdest and saddest planets out there. The enormous gravity of its star, combined with the planets consisting mostly of gas, result in the star slowly devouring its protege. Uh, so pal, like, uh, what's eating you? My mother. WASP-12b has already taken the form of an egg stretched toward its merciless sun, and it's unable to do anything with its condition. In another 10 million years, the planet will inevitably succumb to the voracious star's appetite. Hey, you asked. If you ever wondered what it's like to walk on ice and hot coals at the same time, Gliese 436b is a planet that would give you a vivid example. Being extremely close to its sun, the Neptune-sized exoplanet boasts temperatures hotter than a blazing oven. And yet, it's covered in ice, which burns incessantly. This ice is much denser due to the enormous gravity of the planet, staying solid even under extreme conditions and not melting away. No list of frightening worlds could do without mentioning Venus, the Earth's evil twin. <laughs> The second planet from the Sun has an atmosphere so thick and full of clouds that its surface is much hotter than that of Mercury. Volcanic eruptions constantly thrash Venus. Its gravity is almost a hundred times stronger than ours. And those clouds I mentioned are not made of water, but of sulfuric acid, which condenses and rains down on the ground, adding to the inferno. But even if you were brave, or crazy, enough to try to pass through these clouds, you probably couldn't. The winds up there are as strong as some of the most powerful hurricanes back on Earth. Here we have a very long name for a very, very cold planet. Although the host star is not too far away, it's a small and rather cool red dwarf whose light and heat barely even reach the planet. The temperatures out there fall as low as minus 370 degrees, which is only marginally warmer than absolute zero. The exoplanet is thus dark, gloomy, and covered in eternal ice that never thaws. I thought I thaw that, Thumbworth. Still, if it has a rocky core, it might generate some heat. So there's a chance that deep below the frozen surface, some unknown alien things might lurk. Dimidium. 
located roughly 50 light-years away from our solar system, is a planet hostile to any living thing on many accounts. It's tidally locked to its sun, which means one of its sides is always facing the star, while the other is always turned away. The hot side is heated to over 1,800 degrees, perpetually blown over with winds reaching 600 miles per hour. And that's winter! Well, actually, I don't know that. Despite dimidium being a gas giant, it has a large amount of iron in it, which melts and evaporates in the atmosphere, creating clouds. And when those cool down, they fall on the surface in the infernal rain of molten iron. That'll test your metal. Oxygen is usually viewed as an element that might bring life to a planet, but this is definitely not the case for Osiris. Scientists were shocked to find oxygen on this planet, or rather around it, because it's eight times closer to its star than Mercury is to the Sun. This extreme distance makes Osiris a living melting pot, where anything that could burn will. It's also responsible for a very short orbit of the planet around the star. A year on Osiris is just three and a half days on Earth. To boot, the atmosphere of the planet is constantly blown and melted away by the heat from its sun. Vacation? Nah, let's keep looking. Karat Exo 3b is neither as hot nor as cold as some of the others on this list, but it's terrifying in its own more insidious way. It's a gas giant similar in size to Jupiter, yet 20 times denser. This makes this exoplanet's gravity weigh down on everything on its surface 50 times more than it would on Earth. Stepping on it would be your ultimate doom, because you'd be immediately crushed by the density of its atmosphere. Karat 7b is another oven-like world. Its day-to-day -day temperature is over 4,000 degrees. Combined with the rocky surface, it presents an infernal landscape. The rocks on the ground bubble and boil, evaporating in the atmosphere, where they cool down and eventually fall back on the surface in a brimstone rain. The saddest thing about Karat 7b is that it might have once been a gas giant whose atmosphere melted away from the heat, leaving only the scorched core. An exoplanet is any planet inside our solar system. Some of them are free-floating. Those are called rogue planets. They move around the galactic center. Others orbit their host star, or two. For the first time, astronomers discovered exoplanets in the 1990s. Since then, scientists have found thousands of them. And now, you can sneak a peek too. Spoiler alert, some exoplanets are pretty bizarre. Others resemble our home planet and could probably support life. The closest to Earth exoplanet is Proxima Centauri b. It's a mere 4.2 light years away from Earth. Recently, astronomers have found out that this world might resemble Earth even more than previously thought. It's only 17% more massive than our home planet. It orbits a star that is dimmer and less massive than the Sun. Proxima Centauri b is in the middle of the star's habitable zone. This means that chances are, liquid water and life might exist on the planet. It looks like the exoplanet is tidally locked with its parent star. This means one of its sides faces the star at all times, and the other is always in the darkness. Scientists haven't figured out yet whether the planet has an atmosphere. It's traveling too close to its star and completes one orbit within 11 Earth days the radiation from the star might be pulling the planet's air away. If this is the case, Proxima Centauri b isn't likely to have liquid water on its surface. Gleiss 832c is 16 light-years away from Earth. In the cosmic scheme of things, it's a stone's throw away. This exoplanet is five times as massive as Earth and travels much closer to its parent star. That's why a year on this planet lasts a mere 36 days. But since this star is a red dwarf, much cooler and dimmer than the Sun, Gliese 832c gets as much light and heat as our planet does. At the same time, it's still unclear if Gliese 832c is similar to Earth. It probably has a much thicker atmosphere that creates a runaway greenhouse effect. This phenomenon occurs when a planet absorbs more heat from its host star than it can release back into space. This means that Gliese 832c is more likely to resemble scorching hot Venus rather than relatively cool Earth. Another Earth-like planet, 
TOI 700D is 100 light years away from us in the constellation Dorado. It orbits a small and rather cool dwarf star that is about 40% of the mass and size of the Sun. Its surface temperature is half as high as that of our star. The outermost planet, which is the very TOI 700D, is almost the size of Earth. It also sits in the habitable zone of its parent star. No flares from TOI 700 reach the planet. This increases the chances of the exoplanet being habitable. This means it can potentially develop and maintain life. Scientists don't know for sure the exact conditions on the surface of the planet, but one of the computer simulations they've created shows a planet covered with an ocean. It has a very dense atmosphere dominated by carbon dioxide. Astronomers think a similar atmosphere surrounded Mars when it was a young planet. But another 3D model shows TOI 700D as an all-land, cloudless world. That's what our Earth would probably look like if it wasn't covered with oceans. Winds on TOI 700D move away from the night side of the planet and meet in the area that directly faces the star. There is an exoplanet that stands out among the rest because of its awesome magenta color. You can find this world in the Virgo constellation. The planet is called Gliese 504b. The distance between this planet and its parent star is nine times the distance between the Sun and Jupiter. The planet formed relatively recently and is still glowing with heat. That's why its surface looks pinkish. Just 20 light years away from the Sun, which isn't such a great distance when we talk about space, a bizarre rogue planet is roaming our home Milky Way galaxy. But even though this planet doesn't orbit any star, it still has an incredibly powerful magnetic field. It's 4 million times stronger than Earth's magnetic field. The exoplanet also produces amazing auroras. When it was discovered in 2016, astronomers were almost sure they had detected a brown dwarf which is an object too large to be a planet and too small to be a star. But later, scientists received proof that the space object wasn't big enough to be a brown dwarf. The planet sure is a mammoth among its peers. It's 1.2 times as wide as the largest planet of the solar system, Jupiter, and more than 12 times as heavy. Astronomers think the exceptional strong magnetic field helps the planet produce the auroras. But the most curious thing is that they're generated in a different way than auroras on Earth. It might be because the exoplanet's moon helps the planet create these light shows. If you traveled 20,000 light years away from Earth, you'd come close to a red dwarf in the Sagittarius constellation. Such stars are very cool and small. Quite far away from this cold star, there's a planet. The distance between this world and its host star is so great that the planet receives very little heat. It's one of the coldest planets ever detected. The average surface temperature on the planet is lower than negative 360 degrees Fahrenheit. That's why the entire planet is covered with a thick layer of ice. If you stepped onto its surface, you'd see nothing but glaciers, plains, and mountains of ice. And still, astronomers claim life might exist deep beneath the frozen surface. All because the core of the planet is likely to generate enough heat to melt some of its inner ice. In this case, there would be an enormous subsurface ocean, maybe even swarming with bizarre life forms on the planet. One of the oldest exoplanets we know about is PCR B162026b. It's about 12.7 billion years old. It's almost three times as old as Earth, which appeared 4.5 billion years ago. This also means that the Genesis planet formed only about 1 billion years after the Big Bang. The planet is so old that its two parent stars have had enough time to evolve into a white dwarf and a pulsar, making almost 100 revolutions per second. Sunrises on this planet must look awesome! I bet the next exoplanet isn't like any other you might have seen before. It's often called Super Saturn, or Saturn on steroids. That's because J1407b has a colossal system of rings. They're 640 times as large as those of Saturn. 
The bizarre world is 434 light years away from Earth. It's the only planet we know about that has rings similar to Saturn's. If you moved J1407b to our solar system and replaced Saturn with it, its rings would look many times larger than a full moon. Astronomers have noticed a gap halfway through the planet's rings. The chances are high that an exomoon the size of Mars orbits the planet somewhere within this gap. If you lived on this moon, you'd have an awesome view every time you looked up into the sky. This exoplanet, called WASP-12b, munches on the light coming from its star. It's one of the darkest worlds people know about. All because its day side consumes light rather than reflects it back into space. The planet is giant, twice the size of Jupiter, and it traps more than 94% of the light that reaches its atmosphere. This is likely to be the main reason for the insane temperatures on the surface of the planet. They can rise up to 4,600 degrees Fahrenheit. It's almost half as hot as the surface of the Sun. WASP-12b travels so close to its host star that it needs just one day to complete one orbit. Its night side isn't as hot as the day side, a mere 2,200 degrees Fahrenheit. Because of this difference in temperature, water vapor and clouds gather above the surface of the planet. From time to time, swirls of material from the planet's superheated atmosphere spill onto its star. About 4,000 light-years away from Earth, there's an exoplanet that might be one enormous diamond. It's five times the size of our planet, but needs only two hours and ten minutes to orbit its parent star. It's a pulsar rotating at a rate of 10,000 times a minute. The planet is denser than any other we've discovered so far. It consists mostly of carbon, which is so dense that astronomers think it might be crystalline. If it was true, it could mean that at least some part of the planet is diamond. On WASP-76b, it rains iron on the night side of the planet, and the temperature on the daytime side rises up to 4,300 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hot enough to vaporize most metals. This exoplanet is a bit smaller than Jupiter and located 640 light-years away from Earth. Such terrifying weather conditions in this world are caused by its unusual orbit. The distance between WASP-76b and its parent star is 10 times shorter than the distance between Mercury and the Sun. That's why the star and the huge planet are tidally locked. One side of WASP-76b always faces the star, and the other side is always pitch black. This bright blue exoplanet sits 62 years away from Earth. A bit larger than Jupiter, it looks calm and peaceful. Its blue color might remind you of our home planet. But this familiar appearance conceals the planet's horrifying nature. The beautiful hue comes from silicate atoms and particles that make up the atmosphere. But the wind speed on the planet can reach 5,400 miles per hour. That's seven times the speed of sound. The temperature there can rise up to 1,600 degrees Fahrenheit. But this isn't the worst. In this bizarre world, it rains glass, sideways. So it's probably not the place where you'd like to spend your vacation. You take a giant straw and begin to inflate Saturn. It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. That's enough. Now let's add some giant rings. That's it. This is Super Saturn, also called Saturn on steroids. It's a real object that scientists discovered in 2012, a planet named J1407b. And astronomers are still not sure what it really is. It could be a gas giant, like Jupiter or Saturn, in our solar system. Then there would be no solid surface there. And if you wanted to set foot on that planet, you'd just fall through it, all the way to the core. But it could also be a brown dwarf. That's something between a large planet and a full-fledged star. Such objects have to be heavy enough to start thermonuclear reactions, like those going on inside stars. But the power of these reactions is too weak for brown dwarfs to glow and emit heat. To imagine the size and weight of J1407b, let's look at our Earth. If you put our planet on a scale, it'll show six and another 21 zeros tons. Our planet is also about 7,900 miles across. Now. 
That's Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system. Its diameter is 11 times as great as that of Earth. It's also 318 times heavier. If Jupiter were a bucket, you could put 1,321 Earths in it. And this is the hero of the day, Super Saturn. It's almost 20 times as large as Jupiter. To balance the scales, you need to put 6,360 Earths on the other side. The planet's rings are so wide that if they were in the solar system, they would take up more than half the space between the Sun and Earth. And if Super Saturn switched places with the original Saturn, you'd see those rings with the unaided eye. They would be larger than a full moon. Presumably, these rings appeared in the same way as the ones around our Saturn. One theory says they're the remains of a moon that was once there. Its orbit was unstable, and over time, the moon got torn apart by the tidal forces of the huge planet it orbited. Small pieces of the former moon took their places in the giant's orbit. They collided with one another, like in a blender. After some time, everything that was left was basically particles of dust and ice moving around the colossal planet. Another theory suggests that the rings appeared after the moon collided with an asteroid or another moon. Then the gravitational blender did its job and turn the moon's debris into the rings. Some scientists think the rings formed at around the same time as the planet itself. So they're just the remains of the planetary nebula, which is a cloud of gas, space debris, and dust. Later, it probably shrunk and solidified to form a planet. We can only guess where Super Saturn got its rings from, but scientists say their mass is 80% of that of Earth. It may mean that the moon that used to orbit J1407b was about the same size as our planet. There's a little gap in the middle of these rings. Scientists think Super Saturn's moon might be there. If this is the case, it should be about the size of Mars. If scientists are right and Super Saturn is actually a brown dwarf, then this is an incredible discovery. Scientists will be able to watch it age. Supposedly, brown dwarfs lose their energy and shrink, fading in the process. And when a brown dwarf exhausts all its energy, it turns into a black dwarf. It's easy to confuse it with a black hole. People haven't discovered black dwarfs anywhere in the universe yet, because they take trillions and quadrillions of years to form. Our universe is too young, and none of the stars, even those that appeared when the universe was born, have had time to become black dwarfs. One of the oldest objects in the universe is the white dwarf, with a pretty long name. WD 0346 plus 246. It's about 11 to 12 billion years old and half as cold as our sun, and it's still cooling. It would need around 10 plus another 15 zeros years to turn into a black dwarf. For comparison, the universe is 1.4 and 10 zeros years old. Scientists believe that a black dwarf will exist for about 10 plus 25 zeros years, feeding on dark matter. After that, its protons, the smallest particles of matter, will begin to decay. And then, the black dwarf will simply evaporate. That will take another 10 plus 49 zeros years. But if the protons remain intact, a much more interesting scenario will await the black dwarf. In another 10 in 1500 zeros years, the black dwarf will become an iron star. It's essentially just a cannonball in space. The Iron Sphere will exist billions of times longer than our entire universe has existed, until it suddenly turns into a black hole. So, the process of the formation of a black dwarf is extremely long. It'd take a regular star an insane amount of time to age that much. But Super Saturn, if it is a brown dwarf, may be much closer to this state. Saturn on steroids is not the only strange planet in our universe. This is Gliese 436b. It's been detected using the transit method. A transit happens when a planet moves between its host star and an observer. It looks similar to a lunar eclipse. This planet is four times the size of Earth and 22 times as heavy. That's almost like Neptune. It's an exotic water world. The water there is solid, but it's not ice. It has a temperature of about 520 degrees Fahrenheit. The water in your pot turns into steam at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. But on Gliese 436b, the liquid remains solid because of the extreme pressure on the planet. Scientists have also discovered that the planet's atmosphere is evaporating into outer space. That's why there's a giant circular cloud around it. It's constantly moving in its orbit, giving the planet a long tail that looks like that of a comet. 
Cancri E holds incredible riches worth more than all the money on earth. There are diamonds scattered all over the planet. Cancri E is about twice as wide and eight times as heavy as earth. This planet doesn't rotate. Only one of its sides always faces its host star. The surface temperature there is almost twice as high as the temperature of a burning fire. And since the host star is rich in carbon, the planet contains plenty of this element too. The intense pressure and temperatures help turn carbon into graphite and diamonds. Unfortunately, this planet is 40 light years away from our home. So it'd take about 730,000 years to get there on a regular rocket. Another planet rich in gems is Hat P7b. It's about 1,000 light years away from Earth. It's 60% as large and nearly twice as heavy as Jupiter. The planet is so close to its host star that it makes one revolution around it in just two Earth days. Because of such close proximity to the star, Hat P7b is almost as hot as a white dwarf. If you look at the night side of this planet, you'll see unusual clouds. Scientists believe that these clouds may be rich in corundum material. This is the very substance that forms rubies and sapphires, so it's likely to rain very expensive and beautiful gems there. WASP-12b is one of the darkest planets ever discovered. Only one of its sides faces its host star. The planet's surface is so dark that it eats up about 94% of all visible light, so it looks a lot like a black hole. The host star heats up the planet so much that the material there continuously evaporates. Then the star's strong gravity pulls this cloud toward itself, forming a disk. But TRES-2b is the champion. It's the darkest planet known to people. It absorbs 99% of the light coming from its star, which means it consumes more light than a piece of coal. 1% of the remaining light looks red as it gets reflected by this gas giant. From afar, this planet looks very evil. One of the oldest planets in the universe is PSR B1620 26b. It's about 12.7 billion years old. This means that it formed about 1 billion years after the Big Bang. The planet is so old that its two host stars have had time to evolve. One is a white dwarf. The other is a pulsar that makes almost 100 revolutions per second. Sunrises on this planet must be stunning. Right now, this star system is moving toward a dense cluster of stars. This is likely to lead to a stellar collision, so the fate of this planet is unknown. Kepler-438b is one of the most Earth-like planets. It's only 12% larger and is in the habitable zone of its host star, not too close and not too far away. It's a sweet spot where water doesn't evaporate because of the heat and doesn't turn into ice because of the cold. This planet might host life on its surface. In the future, it may also become a new home for humanity, but it would take people about 470 years to get to this planet even if we traveled at the speed of light, which is impossible due to the laws of physics. You take off from Earth and park your spacecraft somewhere near the moon. You're now almost 240,000 miles away from your home planet. That's almost 100 widths of the United States. Now you take out a giant hammer and an enormous chisel using the robotic arms of your spaceship. You place the chisel at the Earth's North Pole and strike its head with the hammer. Earth splits open like an eggshell, and you see it, another planet. It's Thea, and it's hiding inside our planet, like a yolk in an egg. You'd need to go back in time 4.5 billion years to find out how it got there. This beautiful nebula will soon become our solar system. Colored dust and various space debris are slowly coming closer toward the common center, Soon, this jigsaw puzzle of debris becomes too heavy and dense. The temperature inside the giant is rising. Soon, it gets so high that it triggers a nuclear chain reaction. Another second and BAM! There's an explosion so powerful that the shockwaves travel far into dark space. And the blinding flash from this blast can be seen from the other side of the Milky Way galaxy. When the dust clears a little, you can see that a bright light is still shining at the very center of the explosion. This newborn star is the Sun. It weighs as much as 333,000 Earths. If the Sun was a bucket, you'd need 1.3 million Earth-sized planets to fill it. You're interested in a small object over there, 93 million miles away from the Sun. This pile of rocks and hot lava is Earth. 
Right now, the planet is busy forming its core, while the oceans of lava are gradually cooling down. But a few tens of million years after the Sun's birth, you notice a strange object hurtling toward Earth. It's Thea. This small planet was born at about the same time as Earth, and now it's following a crazy spiral trajectory at enormous speed. Scientists believe Thea was kind of a ball Jupiter and Venus played with. Venus was pulling Thea in one direction, then Big Brother Jupiter pulled it back. But the Sun makes up 99.8% of the mass of the entire solar system. That's why the star sets its own rules. It makes Thea move in almost the same orbit as Earth. So they inevitably come closer and closer to each other until they become next-door neighbors. We see that Thea is the size of Mars and as wide as the Atlantic Ocean from New York to Portugal. A collision can't be avoided. Thea is traveling toward Earth at nearly 9,000 miles per hour. That's 11 times faster than the speed of sound. If the smaller planet crashes into Earth at a particular angle, Earth will most likely be torn apart, as well as Thea itself. The collision will cause a huge blast, visible on other planets even on a bright day. Nothing will be left but some burning dust and debris. Even if Thea touches Earth only lightly, it'll still knock out a chunk of our planet the size of Australia. But the collision with Thea happens at a perfect 45-degree angle. It strikes the Earth at tremendous speed. The explosion literally vaporizes huge amounts of rock, and the shock wave sends the remaining debris into Earth's orbit. A huge crater is formed at the impact site. Soon, it gets filled with boiling lava. The remnants of Thea and the ejected fragments of Earth begin to orbit our planet. According to one version, these fragments form two moons. At first, they travel together, but one day, they get too close to each other and collide, forming one large space body. The other theory claims that all the shards start being pulled by the remnants of Thea. Sometime later, they form the moon as we now know it. At that point in the past, though, it's just red-hot rock and lava. The collision at this angle slightly tilts our planet and accelerates its rotation. It's because of Thea that we have different seasons and 24 hours in a day. Earth has lithospheric plates. These are enormous solid pieces that make up the crust of our planet. After the collision with Thea, they start to break and crack. It causes carbon, a primary component of all known life on Earth, to start moving all over our planet. So, Earth gets some kind of metabolism. After a few hundred million years, the first living creatures start to appear on our planet. Over nearly four billion years, simple single-celled organisms have been evolving into the life you see today. According to scientists, such a collision is a very rare event. The probability that somewhere out there, there's a planet like ours that has survived the same catastrophe is extremely small. This may be the reason why we are yet to find traces of other civilizations out there in space. Meanwhile, the remains of Thea are still here on Earth. Of course, it doesn't look like an entire planet stuck inside our own. Most of the fragments have melted and blended into the Earth's crust. If you take the top layer off our planet, you'll see two huge lava blobs the size of entire continents. They're right below Africa and the Pacific Ocean. Presumably, these are the remains of Thea. They didn't mix with Earth's mantle because of different densities. It's like mixing water and oil in a glass. The oil will always float up over the water and create an even layer on top of it. But if you raise those lava patches up to the surface, they'd be 100 times higher than Mount Everest. Other remains of Thea might be on the moon. The Apollo space missions brought back many soil samples for analysis. Scientists have concluded that the moon is very similar to Earth in structure. People could drill deep down and take samples there. Then they'd analyze the blobs from Earth. If their structure matched, it'd be 100% proof that Thea did hit Earth 4.5 billion years ago. And that's how we got the moon. But for the time being, Thea remains somewhat mysterious. Scientists are still not sure that the planet actually existed. The whole idea perfectly fits the model of the moon's creation. But in fact, this incredible collision may have never happened. Hop on the Bright Side of Life together with our brand new tees, hoodies, and more. Click the link to pick your choice. Now you travel 41 light years away from Earth to the planet 55 Cancri E. 
It's about twice the size of Earth, and eight times heavier. You take out your giant hammer again and use it to hit the chisel. The planet cracks, and you see, it's a giant diamond. The temperature on this planet is tens of times higher than that of Earth, and its soil is rich in carbon. The heat puts a lot of pressure on this carbon. Its structure changes. First, it turns into graphite. Some more pressure, and graphite turns into diamond. On Earth, diamonds form at depths below 60 miles, where the pressure is 50,000 times greater than on the surface. The temperatures there rise over 1,000 degrees, which is as hot as fire. Diamonds are ejected closer to the surface in volcanic eruptions. Still, people have to dig mines 1,500 feet deep to find these beautiful gems. The Golden Jubilee Diamond is the biggest cut and faceted diamond on Earth. It weighs as much as a chocolate bar and is the size of a hamster. Its price is about $12 million. Now imagine a diamond the size of an entire planet. You decide to fly back to the solar system. Your destination is Jupiter's moon, Europa. It's as wide as the distance between Seattle and Houston, and its mass is less than 1% the mass of Earth. Its surface is enclosed in an icy crust. It's about 19 miles thick. But what if you crack this crust with your giant hammer? Wow, Europa is completely covered in water. It's freezing here, three times colder than at the North Pole on Earth. The water turns into ice almost instantly, but the ocean beneath the surface is still liquid. Europa interacts with Jupiter gravitationally, just like the moon with Earth. This creates tidal forces and heats Europa's core. The core melts the ice around it. The result is a huge ocean, two to three times larger than all of Earth's oceans combined. Scientists believe that water is the basis of life. It may mean that life may exist on Europa. There could be thermal springs, just like at the bottom of our oceans. The water there is probably much warmer. And even though the pressure and temperature in such places are likely to be extreme, simple bacteria may live there. Europa is almost the same age as Earth. This means there has been enough time for living organisms to appear and evolve. Who knows, maybe some advanced civilization is already blooming under this crust of ice. They may be building big cities and dreaming of conquering space right now. But the only thing people can do at the moment is send a probe to Europa and find out if life is possible there. We've been focusing on trying to find life on Mars so much while there is this gem waiting to be explored. This planet is the sixth farthest from the Sun and the second largest in the solar system. You'll find it right behind Jupiter. I'm talking about Saturn, or as they sometimes call it, the jewel of the solar system. It's so different from our planet. First of all, you wouldn't be able to stand there. While Earth consists of rock and other tough stuff, this planet is like a giant ball, mostly made of gases. If you found a swimming pool huge enough to fit Saturn, you could see the planet floating in the water. No wonder, Saturn is the least dense planet in the solar system. It also contains a lot of helium. You know, the gas you put in balloons to make them hover in the air. Saturn is a very windy planet. Winds there are more than four times stronger than the ones we have on Earth. A day over there lasts 10 hours and 14 minutes because Saturn spins on its axis pretty fast. But the planet takes its time while going around the sun. A year there equals 29 Earth years. Saturn's radius is more than 36,000 miles. It means the gas giant is nine times wider than our planet. If Earth was the size of a nickel, Saturn would be as big as a volleyball. Even though some of our planets in our solar system also have rings, Saturn's are the most spectacular ones. You can even see its rings from Earth. And no, you don't have to be a scientist with insanely expensive equipment. All you need is a small telescope. Saturn's rings are not firm. They are made of pieces of dust, rock, and ice. Some of them are as small as grains of sand, and some as big as a house or even a mountain. These are actually bits of asteroids, comets, and shattered moons that fell apart before reaching Saturn. They could be torn into pieces by the planet's powerful gravitational pull. Saturn has over 50 moons, and recently, scientists have discovered some unusual hydrothermal activity on one of them. Enceladus is Saturn's sixth biggest moon, it has four tiger stripes close to one of its poles. Researchers have found that there is an ocean underneath these stripes. Water and ice erupt from that area. So now we can't but wonder, maybe there's life out there.
In the oceans on Earth, some forms of life gather around similar hydrothermal vents. They feed on the chemicals there, same as plants on the surface do with sunlight. And not only that, some of the oldest microbial life on our planet feed on the same energy as the one produced beneath the ocean's surface on Enceladus. It could potentially mean there's life developing there right now. Of course, it takes millions and millions of years for even the simplest organisms to appear. But hopefully, scientists will need less time to find more complex forms of life. There are millions of exoplanets out there in space, and scientists have been searching for those that could be potentially habitable. Exoplanets are planets orbiting a star outside of our solar system. Dwarf stars are similar, less luminous than the Sun. They sometimes live for more than 10 billion years. That's enough time for a living organism to develop and evolve into a more complex form. Life might appear on the planets orbiting such dwarf stars, or, like with Saturn, on one of their moons. And here it is, Gliese 876b, that orbits the red dwarf star Gliese 876. This planet is mostly a mystery, but scientists assume this is a gas giant that has no solid surface. They believe its atmosphere doesn't have clouds, but there might be water in its liquid form on the planet's surface. T Gardens B orbits a red dwarf that's around 12 light years away from our solar system. The planet's mass is just a bit higher than that of Earth. Scientists think it may have a rocky surface. The planet needs around five days to complete its orbit. It means that one year on T Gardens B is actually shorter than one week on Earth. Somewhere far, far away, there's another potentially habitable planet named Kepler-1638b. Okay, to be more precise, it's 3,000 light years away from Earth in the constellation Cygnus. This planet is four times as heavy as Earth and twice as wide. It needs almost 260 days to complete one orbit around its star. The gravity on this planet is stronger than that on Earth. It wouldn't be an easy feat to jump on its surface. One more Kepler coming along. This time, it's Kepler-62e, a planet that's more than one and a half times the size of Earth. Scientists believe this one has a warm, humid, and hospitable atmosphere with cloudy skies. There are 1,200 light years between Earth and this planet. Kepler-62e needs 122 days to orbit its red dwarf star. Its neighbor, Kepler-62f, is another potentially habitable zone. It's a world around 40% bigger than Earth, Scientists think this planet might be covered in water. The oceans on our planet are full of interesting creatures and organisms of all sizes. So the chances are, this planet also hides some intriguing living beings. Or at least, it has the potential to develop life. When we say habitable, it doesn't mean life definitely exists there. It just means there are conditions for some forms of life to develop. LHS 1140b is a planet located in one of the potentially habitable zones. Unlike its gas companions, it's solid and quite rocky. The planet's radius is 60% larger than that of Earth, and its mass is seven times bigger. It's one of the densest planets found out there. Since the planet has a big mass, an atmosphere there must be rather thick. Plus, gravity on its surface is much stronger than here on Earth. That's why you would likely have problems just standing on that planet. Hello and greetings from TRAPPIST-1, an ultra-cool dwarf in the constellation Aquarius. It's around 39 light-years away from us. Seven Earth-sized rocky planets are orbiting in the star's habitable zone. All of them can potentially have some water on their surfaces. The temperature on these planets is more or less similar to that on Earth. On the Moon, gravity is only 16% of what we have on our home planet. That's why the astronauts could hardly control their movements when they visited our natural satellite. But when it comes to the gravity on TRAPPIST-1 planets, you would probably feel good and comfortable there. And Kepler once again. This time it's Kepler-452b. It's a rocky planet 60% larger than Earth. Its parent star is similar to our Sun. This planet has actually spent around 6 billion years in the habitable zone, while Earth has been there for a mere 4.5 billion years. This planet needs 385 days to orbit Kepler-452. This star is around 20% brighter than our Sun, but has the same temperature. The whole system is very far from our little oasis. It would take you 28 million years to get there. And now, how about KOI 7711.01? It's another intriguing world 1,700 light-years away from us. This planet is only 30% bigger than Earth. 
it gets almost the same amount of heat as we receive from our sun. Sometime in the future, people might start colonizing the galaxy. They would be looking for new planets to live on. Then we'd certainly have to make really long trips, and maybe one day we'd reach Proxima Centauri. It's a nearby star that has a couple of planets we could potentially inhabit, like Proxima Centauri b. It's around four light years away from Earth, and it doesn't sound that far at first, but it actually is. It would take about 6,300 years to travel there, if we use the technologies that are available these days. It would mean many, many generations to make a trip like that, and it would take even longer to finally inhabit that new world. People would be born and raised on spaceships. They would live their lives there without ever seeing either Earth or the planet they're heading to. Instead of trees, mountains, and rivers, there would be only the dark nothingness of faraway galaxies spreading in front of them. They would never be able to wander unknown streets, breathe in the fresh air, feel the wind. The only place for them to travel to would be another part of the ship. Certainly, such a journey wouldn't be simple, but it would pay off if people managed to build some more beautiful worlds like the one we have here on Earth. Is that even possible? Time will tell. The weird thing about Fomalhaut B isn't its name, but the fact that it doesn't exist. It was first photographed back in 2008 and was a sensation. Scientists believe it to be a massive exoplanet, but it turned out to have low mass and it's falling to pieces of dust at the moment. It acts like a massive dust cloud. Gliese 1214b is quite extraordinary with its steamy environment. Wait, but steam is the result of water evaporation, isn't it? In fact, this hot planet is full of water-like substances. It's definitely hotter than our planet, with its 250 to 540 degrees Fahrenheit. It can also be an ocean planet. Still, very little is known about it since it was first discovered only back in 2009. If you ever wondered what it's like to walk on ice and hot coals at the same time, meet Gliese 436b. Being extremely close to its sun, the Neptune-sized exoplanet boasts temperatures hotter than a blazing oven. And yet, it's covered in ice, which burns incessantly. This ice is much denser due to the enormous gravity of the planet, staying solid even under extreme conditions and not melting away. But Gliese seems a nice place with quite mild climate compared to an oven like Caro 7b. Its day-to-day -day temperature is over 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Combined with the rocky surface, it presents a kind of underworld landscape. The rocks on the ground bubble and boil, evaporating in the atmosphere where they cool down and eventually fall back on the surface in a brimstone rain. The saddest thing about Caro 7b is that it might have once been a gas giant whose atmosphere melted away from the heat, leaving only the scorched core. Caro Exo 3b is neither as hot as the previous one, nor as cold as many other planets. It's a gas giant similar in size to Jupiter, yet 20 times denser. It makes this exoplanet's gravity weigh down on everything on its surface 50 times more than it would on Earth. Stepping on it would be your ultimate doom, because you'd be immediately crushed by the density of its atmosphere. Tress 2b is a planet where night never ends. And it's not your regular night with stars shining in the beautiful skies. Here, it's pitch dark and scorching hot. Tress 2b is a gas giant roughly 1.5 times more massive than Jupiter, and its surface absorbs light better than charcoal. It might also have a faint dark red glow because of its burning air, which is as hot as fresh lava. It may mistakenly seem that Saturn does have an Earthen-friendly environment. Some layers of this giant gas sphere actually have quite nice temperature conditions. If you dive into Saturn, you'll get to a layer with liquid molecules with 32 degrees Fahrenheit, which seems like Earth. Anyway, it's only one minor layer, and the rest of the planet is freezing cold. So you'll never be able to land on Saturn and be the same human being like you are on Earth. But you can become a sort of snowball there, or an ice crystal. As for Jupiter, you might have already guessed that there's no solid land. This planet is made of hydrogen and helium, 
So it's another gas sphere you can't walk on. It's a bit different from Saturn, though. You wouldn't dive in Jupiter. You'd rather float on it. This planet is like a giant cloud. And if you ever landed on it, it would be like walking through a super thick fog. The temperatures fluctuate a lot here. It's freezing on the surface. Unlike Saturn, the deeper you dive, the more scorching this gas sphere gets. Oxygen is usually viewed as an element that might bring life to a planet. But this is definitely not the case for Osiris. Scientists were shocked to find oxygen on this planet, or rather around it, because it's eight times closer to its star than Mercury is to the Sun. This extreme distance makes Osiris a living melting pot where anything that could burn will. It's also responsible for a very short orbit of the planet around its star. A year on Osiris is just 3.5 days on Earth. To boot, the atmosphere of the planet is constantly blown and melted away by the heat from its sun. WASP-76b is another weirdly dangerous planet where it rains. No, not wasps. It's so hot out there, over 4,300 degrees Fahrenheit, that it vaporizes iron. So it rains iron. It's another gas giant, just like Jupiter. Its extreme proximity to the sun divides the planet in two. One half has a never-ending day, while the other has eternal night. Meet WASP-12b, one of the weirdest and saddest planets out there. The enormous gravity of its star, combined with the planet consisting mostly of gas, result in the star slowly devouring its protege. WASP-12b has already taken the form of an egg, stretched towards its merciless sun and unable to do anything with its condition. In another 10 million years, the planet will inevitably succumb to the voracious star's appetite. No list of the weirdest planets could do without mentioning Venus, the Earth's evil twin. The second planet from the Sun has an atmosphere so thick and full of clouds that its surface is much hotter than that of Mercury, despite being somewhat farther from the Sun. Volcanic eruptions constantly thrash Venus. Its gravity is almost 100 times stronger than ours, and those clouds I mentioned are not made of water, but of sulfuric acid, which condenses and rains down on the ground, adding to the inferno. But even if you were brave, or crazy, enough to try to pass through those clouds, you probably couldn't. The winds up there are as strong as some of the most powerful hurricanes back on Earth. One more freezing cold planet is the one I dare not pronounce. Although the host star is not too far away, it's a small and rather cool red dwarf whose light and heat barely even reach the planet. The temperatures out there fall as low as negative 370 degrees Fahrenheit, which is only marginally warmer than absolute zero. The exoplanet is thus dark, gloomy, and covered in eternal ice. Still, if it has a rocky core, it might generate some heat, so there is a chance that deep below the frozen surface, we could build a nice thermal spa hotel for space travelers. The next planet that sounds like a tongue twister is the only exoplanet in the orbit of its star. And at first glance, it looks quite pretty. Blue and white swirls making up wondrous patterns on the surface. But these pleasant colors actually come from hard silicate particles in the planet's atmosphere, which means it rains glass here. But the worst thing is that winds reach the speed of 5,400 miles per hour, or almost Mach 7. For comparison, the fastest wind speed on Earth was 254 miles per hour, over 20 times less. Thus, the glass falling from the sky travels horizontally at hypersonic speeds, shredding everything in its path. Here's another name we'll just leave on the screen, thank you. This magnetic rogue planet, let's call it Simp, has probably the best auroras in the universe, putting our northern lights to shame. Dimidium, located roughly 50 light years away from our solar system, is a planet hostile to any living thing on many accounts. It's tidally locked to its sun, which means one of its sides is always facing the star, while the other is always turned away. 
the hot side is heated to over 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit, perpetually blown over with winds reaching 600 miles per hour. Despite Domitium being a gas giant, it has a large amount of iron in it, which melts and evaporates in the atmosphere, creating clouds. And when these cool down, they fall on the surface in the infernal rain of molten iron. In the star system of 55 Cancri, there are five planets, four of which are gas giants similar to Jupiter and Saturn. But the fifth one, or rather, the first, because it's closest to the star, is different in a most horrible way. 55 Cancri E is so close to its sun that half the planet's surface is a literal ocean of molten lava. The other half is in eternal darkness because it never sees the sun. The planet is always turned to its star with one side. And between the scorching and the dark, there's the twilight zone, a thin strip of gloomy nothingness. The system whose name I wouldn't even try to pronounce has three exoplanets, which are all being slowly destroyed by their own star. It happens because that star is not a regular one. It's a pulsar, a rapidly spinning core of an exploded star. It creates powerful electromagnetic pulses in several directions, while rotating at several thousand times per second. As a result, the planets orbiting this deceased star are slowly being eaten away and will eventually disappear entirely. TRES-2b is a planet where night never ends. And it's not your regular night with stars shining in the beautiful skies. Here it's pitch dark and scorching hot. TRES-2b is a gas giant, roughly one and a half times more massive than Jupiter, and its surface absorbs light better than charcoal. It might also have a faint dark red glow because of its burning air, which is as hot as fresh lava. Lovely. In the star system of 55 Cancri, there are five planets, four of which are gas giants similar to Jupiter and Saturn. But the fifth one, or rather the first, because it's closest to the star, is different in a most horrible way. 55 Cancri E is so close to its sun that half the planet's surface is a literal ocean of molten lava. The other half is in eternal darkness because it never sees the sun. The planet is always turned to its star on one side. And between the scorching and the dark, there's the twilight zone, a thin strip of gloomy nothingness. HD 189377b oh, I'm not going to say that again is the only exoplanet in the orbit of its star. And at first glance, it looks quite pretty, blue and white swirls making up wondrous patterns on the surface. But these pleasant colors actually come from hard silicate particles in the planet's atmosphere, which means it rains glass here. But the worst is that winds reach the speed of 5,400 miles per hour, or almost Mach 7. Well, for comparison, the fastest wind speed on Earth was 254 miles per hour, over 20 times less. Thus, the glass falling from the sky travels horizontally at hypersonic speeds, shredding everything in its path. The next system, whose name I won't even try to pronounce, um, this one, has three exoplanets, which are all being slowly destroyed by their own star. It happens because that star is not a regular. It's a pulsar, a rapidly spinning core of an exploded star. It creates powerful electromagnetic pulses in several directions while rotating at several thousand times per second. As a result, the planets orbiting this deceased star are slowly being eaten away and will eventually disappear entirely. Kepler 70 is a hot blue dwarf star that exploded into a red giant some 18 million years ago. At the time, it was orbited by at least two planets, the closer of which was a Jupiter-like gas giant. Its name was Kepler 70b, and it still exists. But the overgrown star consumed it and transformed it into a blazing hot rocky world. Right now, it's one of the hottest planets ever discovered. Its temperature is higher than the surface of our sun. It was lucky to survive spending time inside the star, but it's evaporating now and will probably be no more in the near future. WASP-12b is one of the weirdest and saddest planets out there. 
The enormous gravity of its star, combined with the planets consisting mostly of gas, result in the star slowly devouring its protege. WASP-12b has already taken the form of an egg, stretched toward its merciless sun, and it's unable to do anything with its condition. In another 10 million years, the planet will inevitably succumb to the voracious star's appetite. If you ever wondered what it's like to walk on ice and hot coals at the same time, Gliese 436b is a planet that would give you a vivid example. Being extremely close to its sun, the Neptune-sized exoplanet boasts temperatures hotter than a blazing oven. And yet, it's covered in ice, which burns incessantly. This ice is much denser due to the enormous gravity of the planet, staying solid even under extreme conditions and not melting away. No list of frightening worlds could do without mentioning Venus, the Earth's evil twin. The second planet from the Sun has an atmosphere so thick and full of clouds that its surface is much hotter than that of Mercury. Volcanic eruptions constantly thrash Venus. Its gravity is almost 100 times stronger than ours, and those clouds I mentioned are not made of water but of sulfuric acid, which condenses and rains down on the ground, adding to the inferno. But even if you were brave, or crazy, enough to try to pass through these clouds, you probably couldn't. The winds up there are as strong as some of the most powerful hurricanes back on Earth. Here we have a very long name for a very, very cold planet. Although the host star is not too far away, it's a small and rather cool red dwarf, whose light and heat barely even reach the planet. The temperatures out there fall as low as minus 370 degrees, which is only marginally warmer than absolute zero. The exoplanet is thus dark, gloomy, and covered in eternal ice that never thaws. Still, if it has a rocky core, it might generate some heat. So there's a chance that deep below the frozen surface, some unknown alien things might lurk. Dimidium, located roughly 50 light years away from our solar system, is a planet hostile to any living thing on many accounts. It's tidally locked to its sun, which means one of its sides is always facing the star, while the other is always turned away. The hot side is heated to over 1800 degrees, perpetually blown over with winds reaching 600 miles per hour. Despite Dimidium being a gas giant, it has a large amount of iron in it, which melts and evaporates in the atmosphere, creating clouds. And when those cool down, they fall on the surface in the infernal rain of molten iron. Oxygen is usually viewed as an element that might bring life to a planet, but this is definitely not the case for Osiris. Scientists were shocked to find oxygen on this planet, or rather around it, because it's eight times closer to its star than Mercury is to the Sun. This extreme distance makes Osiris a living melting pot, where anything that could burn will. It's also responsible for a very short orbit of the planet around the star. A year on Osiris is just three and a half days on Earth. To boot, the atmosphere of the planet is constantly blown and melted away by the heat from its sun. Karat Exo 3b is neither as hot nor as cold as some of the others on this list, but it's terrifying in its own more insidious way. It's a gas giant similar in size to Jupiter, yet 20 times denser. This makes this exoplanet's gravity weigh down on everything on its surface 50 times more than it would on Earth. Stepping on it would be your ultimate doom, because you'd be immediately crushed by the density of its atmosphere. Karat 7b is another oven-like world. Its day-to-day -day temperature is over 4,000 degrees. Combined with the rocky surface, it presents an infernal landscape. The rocks on the ground bubble and boil, evaporating in the atmosphere, where they cool down and eventually fall back on the surface in a brimstone rain. The saddest thing about Karat 7b is that it might have once been a gas giant whose atmosphere melted away from the heat, leaving only the scorched core. We're used to thinking that asteroids are the only free-floating rocks in space, but things like OTS-44 make you think twice and shiver. Imagine a planet about 11 times more massive than Jupiter roaming in space without being bound to the orbit of any star. Given its gargantuan size and mass, if OTS-44 collides with any other planet, it would utterly destroy it 
and go on floating as if nothing happened. Scarier still, scientists are sure there are millions of such rogue planets out there, just waiting to be discovered. There's no hard proof of their existence yet, but theoretically, carbon planets have formed somewhere closer to the center of our galaxy. Any oxygen getting in their atmosphere will get into a reaction with carbon and transform into CO2, forming black, toxic clouds. On the ground, there would be oceans made of tar, spewing up geysers of methane and crude oil. There would be rains, too, but they'd be far from refreshing. Torrents of pure gasoline and hot liquid asphalt would blast the ground and probably burst into flames on impact. Hard to imagine anything that would survive such conditions. Magma oceans, supersonic winds, scorching hot days, and instead of rain, a bunch of rocks falling on your head. Just another one of those days, huh? <laughs> Astronomers recently discovered a new super planet out there. K2-414b is an exoplanet that's around 200 light-years away and in serious need of a new name. An exoplanet is just a fancy way of saying that a planet orbits its own star in another solar system. The Earth orbits the Sun, so this planet has its own orbit party going on. So what makes K2, bunch of numbers, so scary? Picture our beautiful little blue planet Earth. Now imagine that all the volcanoes in the world suddenly erupted at the same time and lava covered the oceans and seas. Fiery hurricanes, thousands of times faster than normal, blow all over the place, 24-7. And it starts raining rocks every now and again. Rocks! Like on your head. Thankfully, not in your head. This scary planet came into our lives about two years ago. Scientists are still studying it. So, what's a typical day like? For starters, you can forget about breathing. Oxygen decided to take a pass on this planet. You'd have to get used to sodium, silicon monoxide, and silicon dioxide. Which is, as you guessed, not great. And that's just scratching the surface. Who knows what other chemicals are lying around? And yes, magma oceans. The planet's surface is covered in molten magma as far as the eye can see. This lava planet orbits really close to its star, which is why the surface is like a fireplace. The closest planets to our Sun are Mercury and Venus, but this planet's even closer. And what's even more weird is that half the planet is in constant daytime, the other half, night. It's tidal locked, just like our Moon is. No matter how long you stare at it, you'll never see the other side. That's why the all-day, everyday scorching, fiery side is so hot and overflowing with magma oceans, while the other side's in a constant state of deep freeze. If the magma doesn't burn you, you've still got big problems, and please don't look up. It's raining rocks. On Earth, water turns to steam, rises up, becomes clouds, cools, and falls as rain. Over there, on planet Fireball, it's exactly the same, except for it's rocks, people. The planet's so hot, it vaporizes rocks. Oh, and don't forget the supersonic winds with speeds up to 3,000 miles per hour. Imagine your hat getting blown off your head at five times faster than an airplane. The strongest wind on Earth was the tropical cyclone Olivia that hit Australia. It was blowing at 250 miles per hour. Now imagine 12 times that. On the sunny side of the planet, you're looking at a roasting 5,000 degrees. The hottest it ever got on Earth's surface was in California, 135 degrees. It's pretty common for it to get near that temperature in the Sahara Desert, but that kind of heat's not exactly enough to make rocks evaporate. If you grew up near a desert, you already know how dry and hot it always is. But did you know that deserts can reach freezing temperatures? A desert, by definition, is a large area with little or no rainfall. That means no water vapor to keep the temperatures from going insane. In the daytime, the sun heats up the desert like an oven. But when the sun sets, the heat packs up and heads home, and it can get really cold. Some deserts have even reached minus 40 degrees at night. But wait! Shouldn't deserts have snow if it's that cold? Well, some deserts have had a bit of snow here and there. But because there's no water vapor, there can't be that much snow just dry, freezing, sandy Sahara nights. Now, the Sahara Desert's actually not the largest desert on Earth. 
It's Antarctica. 5 million square miles of icy dryness, almost no people, and a whole bunch of cute penguins. Penguins technically live in a desert. Back to the fireball planet, this time the night side. Never-ending darkness and extreme cold, about minus 330 degrees. Add in some supersonic winds? Earth's coldest? Minus 130 degrees at a research center in Antarctica. So, how does this jalapeno pepper exoplanet stack up against some of our neighbors? Well, Mars isn't exactly livable either. It's the red planet, so you'd think it'd be hot most of the time. But it's usually freezing. Well, way below freezing. And if you're planning a weekend getaway to Mars, you can leave the umbrella at home. Nah, it doesn't rain rocks, and it actually hasn't rained there for millions of years. At least Mars has days and nights, and it's like Earth in other ways. Mars' equator is steamy hot, and it gets pretty cold at the North and South Poles, just like Earth. Scientists even discovered old bits of carbon dioxide snow there. The entire planet is actually covered in carbon dioxide, with a splash of nitrogen here and there. Scientists even reported intense snowstorms on Mars. But because it's mostly carbon dioxide, it's not your typical snowstorm. It's more like a dry ice storm. That's the stuff they use in fog machines. Mars isn't the only place where climates are going cuckoo. Jupiter's famous for its gigantic storms. Not like the ones we know on Earth. I'm talking about storms that last for centuries. The great red spot on Jupiter is actually a 400-year-old storm and you could fit four whole Earths inside of it. So it's been around for a while, but it's nowhere near as intense as the storms on K2. Venus also has intense rain, but it's not made of rocks. It sort of works. It rains sulfuric acid. That stuff can give you severe skin burns and rip nasty holes through your umbrella. Venus's atmosphere is filled with carbon dioxide, which acts like a net to trap in the sun's radiation, and it's insanely hot. No magma oceans, though. Mercury is the closest planet to the sun and doesn't even have an atmosphere. That means no storms, clouds, rain, wind, whatever. Mercury is kind of like a desert here on Earth. No water vapor and no rainfall. That means temperatures shoot up during the day and drop like crazy at night. The K2 exoplanets, like the most extreme parts of all of our solar system, all rolled into one scary planet. But we're not headed there anytime soon. We haven't even been to Mars yet. That's all way off in the future, and 200 light years is a really long travel time. If we're going to move anywhere anytime soon, we'll probably want to set up camp on the moon. No magma oceans, no warp speed winds, nice temperatures. So where would we even start? Well, the main issue is that drones and remote control robots are getting more and more advanced. It's way cheaper to send them over to map out the moon for us while we're safe here on Earth. And if we ever want to begin space exploration for real, we'd need a proper space base. And what better place than our little shiny moon? So, why do we even study those far-off planets? What's the point? Well, planets are like people. They're all different ages and live in all different places. The more of them we study, the more we can understand why there's life, aka us, on Earth and not on any other planet so far. When we see crazy new planets, we get crazy new ideas, which can turn into awesome inventions that make our lives easier. Even just going into space gives us new ideas. Scratch-proof lenses, some firefighting equipment, water filtration systems, wireless headsets, invisible braces, that tiny vacuum you use to clean those crumbs in from between your couch cushions, they were all invented to help astronauts work better in space. And now they make our lives better every day. Maybe we'll figure out a new energy source someday, thanks to a far-off planet or star. Or we might discover a new compound that will make our building stronger or more energy efficient. 